I'm going to call to order the uh, Salem Housing Authority for April 8, 2013. Call it. roll. Commissioner Tesler is absent. Commissioner Nanke? Here. Commissioner Clausen? Here. Commissioner Dickey? Here. Commissioner Thomas? Here. Commissioner Benares? Here. Commissioner Clem? Here. Chair Bennett? Here. If you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have no one signed up for public comment. Was there anyone that wanted to uh, address the housing authority? Okay, thank you. There may be someone here. Is this on the housing authority? Okay. Councillor Nanke, could you move the consent agenda calendar? I would be pleased, Mr. Chair. I would move the consent calendar. Second. Second by Clausen. Uh, Mr. Wilch, did you have anything you want to highlight in your information? Not in the program management report, no, sir. I would like to talk about a different issue if it's time for that. Very good. There is. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to update the commissioners and the general public uh, about activities and action that the Salem Housing Authority has had to take in order to um, uh, manage federal funding cuts. 90% of the funds that come to the Salem Housing Authority are federal funds subject to an annual federal appropriations. As many of you know, certainly, and the public knows, uh, there are cuts through something called a sequestration. So funding for SHA has been cut. We had initially, at the beginning of this budget year, anticipated 80% of our rental voucher money, and what we anticipate getting is 69%. Um, at the beginning of the budget year, we anticipated 95% of our funds that go to support public housing, um, and what we believe we're actually going to get is 81%. Now, like always we don't really know exactly what our budget is with the federal government it all gets reconciled at the end of the year however we've looked at the worst case scenario and convened with the executive director and i know she's talked with all of you about the necessity for us to reduce our costs due to the federal funding cuts this past thursday i talked with staff about uh, a reduction in hours um, we've identified several fridays over the next six months uh, 12 Fridays to be exact. Uh, we hope it's not 12. It could be less. Um, both management and represented staff are all um, going leave without pay on these 12 days. So clearly I have a motivation to get everybody back to work as quickly as possible as well. Um, I might add that um, it's a salary reduction. Uh, we're holding benefits harmless. 100% of the benefits staff will receive. Uh, all of the accruals for the vacation and, and other entitlements that they receive for work, uh, they will receive during those days. Um, and um, I think the uh, I think the final uh, the, the the interesting part is HUD already has seven days of uh, furloughs they call them um, uh, that they're going to be taking, and so we're going to at least for those seven be mirroring their days off. Um, all of our offices will be closed to the public. Uh, clearly our offices will be open to our residents of our properties who we have contractual obligations to be available and support them. Um, we will have a few essential personnel available. Uh, it will be uh, seamless for our current residents. They can call on our maintenance line to get a maintenance person. They can call on our property management line to talk with someone if they have a lease issue. So uh, we don't anticipate uh, an interruption in service, uh, though we will be closed uh, several Fridays and that could possibly uh, uh, interrupt service for someone if they were walking into the office and were unaware. Uh, we've posted a press release. We have a series of communications out to our clients uh, and to the general public and uh, believe and hope that we're covering uh, our communication bases soundly. 
Great. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <coughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Wilch. Uh, we have a motion for the consent calendar. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, we have no other business, uh, so the Housing Authority is adjourned. Thank you. my chair up like a throne, after all. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's City Council. I'm so pleased to see that we have such a wonderful turnout. We have so many guests tonight. We have some special announcements, and we have some uh, very important proclamations, and then some interesting issues. So welcome all. We'll get started. I'll call to order this evening's meeting of the Salem City Council for April 8th, 2013. Would the recorder please call the roll? Councillor Bennett? Here. Councillor Tesler? Present. Councillor Nanke? Here. Councillor Clausen? Here. Councillor Dickey? Here. Councillor Thomas? Here. Councillor Benars? Here. Councillor Clem? Here. Mayor Peterson? Here. Thank you. Councillor Bennett, will you please introduce additions or deletion deletions? Yes. Do we have any? Uh, Madam Mayor, I move uh, additions, deletions, and revisions uh, that uh, councilors have at their desks. Second. It's been moved by Councilor Bennett and seconded by Councilor Clausen to move the additions, deletions, and corrections that are apparent on our desks. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. A few months ago, we instituted a special time on our agenda for council comment. And tonight, I'd like to open the council comment with a few words um, in memory and in tribute to a person that our community said goodbye to today, a longtime advocate for Salem, for business, for children, for schools, for drug abuse prevention, and for all of our various bonds measures that we had recently, streets and bridges, the fire bond measure that brought about funding for new fire equipment and for new stations and upgraded stations, worked tirelessly to bring actual airline service to Salem. And of course, I'm talking about Mike McLaren, who was the executive director of the Salem Area Chamber of Commerce but more than that, for so many of us across the community and so many of us here at the city, he was a friend, he was a leader, he was a mentor. And he was a person whom, in my 15 years of friendship and, and collaboration with him on projects, I found that he was a person with a heart that went far beyond just his interest in having a strong business community. He always understood the need for the food drive. He always understood why we needed to have programs for children. He always understood why those who are the least of us needed the attention from the most of us. And for that, I just wanted to take a moment and say a special tribute and thank you to Mike McLaren. Now, I know it's been a busy week or a busy couple of weeks. I think other counselors have some comments they'd like to make. I. Uh, Warren Benars, and then I believe Councillor Clem has some comments. I'm, I'm real pleased this last uh, Thursday, the South Salem Neighborhood Association came in concert with the Croydon Illahi Neighborhood Association, and the two have merged together. They have decided the new name, and I love names, it will be the Southwest Neighborhood or Association of Neighbors, or also known as SWAN. <gasps> we need a SWAN. We have Can Do, we have so many great names. I thought that would be perfect for the south end of town. Anyway, this will make that particular geographic area of Salem stronger because more people will be able to, to come together. I know Croyson Illahi, uh, the, the, the leaders in that uh, neighborhood association have put 
in years of tireless work to keep that neighborhood association going, but there's not a whole lot of issues in that area right now, and so there's not a lot of turnout. This is a healthy thing, I think, for South Salem, Southwest Salem. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Councillor Clem and then Councillor Dickey. Yes, on behalf of uh, the Mayor and City Council, I uh, helped open up the uh, opening day of West Salem Little League. Uh, we all have little leagues and ball clubs and youth sports throughout the city. And I'm just, uh, just r reminded that uh, the great cooperation between the school district who has to struggle between school sports and, and community sports. Um, with uh, the, the various leagues, there's probably about 14 leagues now, and when my kids were growing up, there were four. Um, and the tremendous support from the city staff in scheduling all these fields for all these teams. Uh, but when you look at a room of 600 kids where the hats are bigger than the heads are, um, and the little t-shirts have got um, the sponsors and they're all fired up. Uh, that's what that's the best part of Salem And so I would just also uh, want to thank the sponsors and the parents doing all that but also as well uh, caution for uh, um, It still isn't uh, Summer yet and kids are running in and around um, Ball fields and for us to all just as a matter of public be uh, concerned about safety so uh, Little League is open um, and uh, we're excited throughout the city for all of our sports programs that are uh, going on as well as soccer and a number of the others great thank you Councillor Dickey just wanted to ask Councillor Benars if he knows when the new neighborhood association is meeting in case there are others who would like to attend I believe it's the what is it the first Thursday May 2nd well, May 2nd will be the, the next meeting. And it's it basically it's the same night that the South Salem Neighborhood Association was meeting. They, they decided to accept that at 6.30 in the evening. And they are going to be meeting in the, there's a meeting room at Life Source, so they'll be moving their location. Are there other councilor comments? Yes, Councilor Clausen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the mayor and I had the privilege of doing a rarity these days and attending a groundbreaking ceremony, which is really nice. Uh, we were down in South Salem on the Pack Trust property, and they are breaking ground, broke ground actually, on a uh, new facility for Salem Clinic and then new commercial space as well. So that's really good. It's good for South Salem, get some medical out there in that a uh, little bit more, a little closer to the freeway. So, anyway. Thought you guys would know it, should know it's a good thing for Salem. It's great. Councillor Clausen looks wonderful in a hard hat. <laughs> we were impressed. He knows how to wear one. Great. Other comments from councillors? All right. Thank you very much. We have proclamations this evening, and I'm going to deliver the first one. Uh, Councillor Dickey is going to deliver the second, and then I'll be back up on base for the third one. So if the, uh, our guests tonight from Indus would like to join me over to the right of this podium, we'll get started. Welcome. I'm so pleased to have you all here. Can you all hear me? It's working? Good, all right. On Saturday, I had a very pleasant and um, memorable experience. My family and I were able to attend a very wonderful celebration here in Salem called Holly Celebration. And it was sponsored by Indus. And our guests tonight are gonna to tell you a little bit about Indus, but I'm going to read to you the proclamation that I was able to present that evening. Whereas Salem is an international city whose residents have come from countries around the globe and represent many cultures, religions, races, customs, and whereas organizations and events reflecting these varied aspects of our international city present an important opportunity to learn about each other and spread understanding and acceptance across the community. And whereas Indus, India, U.S. Friendship Association was established in Salem, Oregon in 1983. And whereas the vision of Indus is to promote and strengthen friendship and understanding of cultures between the peoples of Indian subcontinent and United States. And whereas Indus in Salem has brought cultural understanding and experiences to our community for almost 30 years 
and provided a platform for cultural exchange and opportunities for interactions that help Indians and Americans to assimilate each other's strength and build upon them. And whereas Indus was celebrating Holi, a joyous festival that symbolizes victory of good over evil. Holly celebration took place in Salem, and it enriched the fabric of our mutual understanding and shared enjoyment of cultures between the two great countries of India and the United States. And now, therefore, I, Anna Peterson, Mayor of Salem, Oregon, did hereby proclaim and celebrate Indus Holly Celebration 2013 to recognize the members of Indus for their efforts to spread cultural understanding and unity to Salem. And that was on Saturday, April 6. Welcome again. I'm going to turn the microphone over and ask them each to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about Indus. Hello, everybody. I am Jaya Srinivasan, and I'm the president of Indus. Um, I want to just uh, tell a little bit about uh, Salem and how our experience has been um, in Salem. It's a great cosmopolitan and multicultural city. Uh, we have been in Salem for about um, six years now, and uh, we love the Riverfront Park, Mission Mill Museum, you know, Bush Park, and uh, everything else that Salem has to offer for us. Uh, and um, I would really, you know, all of us would sincerely like to thank our mayor um, to recognize our organization and. Um, declare a proclamation, we really feel honored. Um, so to just tell a little bit about um, Indus, uh, the organization has been in Salem for about 30 years. It was created by the founders to enhance and you know uh, share the culture and ideas between peoples of two countries, India and United States. Um, and I think um, Anybody who loves Indian food, you know, Indian culture, Indian dance, music, everybody is welcome to one of our events. Please um, do visit us, and we are going to uh, leave our business cards at the registration if somebody is interested. Um, you know, you are always welcome. Um, thank you again, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yourselves? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm Roshan Jaiswal. I'm the Vice President of Indus. And as Madam Mayor said that, you know, the organization has been in Salem for almost 30 years. But in past few years, we have gathered a lot of momentum and a lot of good things are happening. A um, couple of things that, which is really important to the vision and the goal of Indus is to bring the cultural understanding between the two communities. And that's what we are doing through four major events that we put in a lot of effort in. One was Holi, which is a festival of colors. The next big event would be Diwali. It's a festival of light. And that happens sometime uh, in November. And on our website, you get to know all the information, which is salemindus.org. Then we have a Facebook page associated with that. So there is a lot, lot on social media that we will be sharing with all of you. Whoever is interested, you know, will leave the card as well as you know, reach out to one of us. And we will try to share as much as we can. And again, the idea here is to, you know, see if some of the kids from our community, we can send it to India so they can experience some of the cultural richness from there. Bring some of the kids from India and if they can experience some of the cultural richness from this part of the world. So you know, those kind of cultural exchange and many such events that we are planning to put forward in the next few years. And this is just the stepping stone into that. So I'm excited, we all are very excited and committed to this, do this, but you know, we need a lot of support from the community here. And we hope to have that in the next few years from all of you. So thank you, Mayor, for giving us this opportunity. I'm Dr. John Chupala. That's my name. And I've been president of Indus, I think, a few times over the last <laughs> 20 years. And one good thing about growing old is then you become advisor. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I am. <laughs> so I'm enjoying my time. And you see the youthful energy here. And uh, I'm in the back. <laughs> and I'm so grateful that uh, Mayor is now on the bandwagon and uh, giving us opportunities to um, be recognized by the city of Salem. We always appreciate your guidance. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Next we have a proclamation for Prescription Drug and Heroin, Heroin Abuse Prevention Month. So I'm gonna ask um, Marion County Commissioner Patty Milne and Allison Kelly, Marion County Children and Families Commission Director to come up. I'm gonna go ahead and read the proclamation and I'll give you an opportunity to speak if you have some words. Whereas the abuse of prescription medications is a growing public health concern and whereas every day in the United States more than 2,500 teenagers abuse prescription medication for the first time and whereas opiate-based prescription drugs can fuel addiction that causes the user to desperately seek more causing some prescription drug abusers to turn to heroin, another opiate, which can be stronger, cheaper, more addictive, and whereas heroin-related arrests in Oregon are up 70% over the last two years. In Marion County, possession of heroin was up 30% in 2011, and delivery of heroin was up 60% over the same time frame. And whereas, 70% of all prescription drugs that end up in the bloodstreams of our children and youth come from family and friends, and many young people mistakenly think that it is safer to misuse prescription medications than illegal street drugs. And whereas parents and other family members are often unaware that a loved one is abusing prescription medications. And whereas when used properly, prescription medications have a legitimate medical use, but misuse of these medications can lead to addiction, overdose, and even death. And whereas the city of Salem wants to call attention to this problem and help parents, families, and other community members understand we each have a role to play to curb the abuse of prescription medications and heroin. And now, therefore, I, Councillor Diana Dickey, on behalf of Mayor Anna Peterson, recognize the importance of preventing prescription drug abuse and heroin use in the city of Salem and do proclaim the month of April 2013 as Prescription Drug and Heroin Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you very much, Councillor Dickey. Appreciate it, and Mayor Peterson, thank you so much, and, and the rest of the councillors for uh, approving or uh, proclaiming uh, April as, uh, I'm gonna get it all, prescription. prescription drug abuse. We've had several prevention months in April. So um, I, I want to um, first point out that um, Mayor Anna Peterson sits on our Public Safety Coordinating Council as does your chief of police, uh, Jerry Moore. And this effort is um, a joint effort between our Marion County Public Safety Coordinating <coughs> Council and also the Children and Families Commission. And um, we're, as you can tell by listening to these um, startling statistics that are in the proclamation, this is a, a, a very important issue about protecting our children, our young people, teenagers, but also um, adults end up unfortunately abusing prescription drugs. And we want to make it clear that with modern medicine and all the wonderful things that our medical professionals can do today, um, there is appropriate use. And thank goodness if you've had a surgery or a condition, you need some medication to help you recover from something or monitor an ailment over a period of time. This is fantastic. But when it's time to finish taking those or you're, you're recovered and you find you still have some of those little pills in that bottle, it's really important to dispose of those properly. And I think um, Allison will talk about how that can happen in a minute. But And to keep them out of the reach of young people and teens or anybody who might be tempted to abuse drugs. So we have a full slate of activities throughout April to um, try to educate people a little bit more, help people understand the severity of, of <coughs> this um, prescription <coughs> drug abuse. And uh, I also want to back up to your police department. Um, uh, Chief Jerry Moore has been fantastic to pull his staff and some of his folks together to help um, in a couple of um, summits that will be taking place, and Allison can talk about those, uh, and the help that they're providing us in, in uh, making some public awareness opportunities and help us all 
learn more about this and fight it. So I'm going to turn this over to Allison, who's our Community Services Director and also the Children and Families Director. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, thank you, Mayor Peterson and Council members. We are, it's a privilege for us to be here today, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, the name of the project, as Commissioner Milne said, is Drug Safe, and there's a website um, that's www.drxugsafe.org. And you can reach that by just going to the Marion County Community Services Department and clicking, you'll find it, or call our department and we'll get you there. But I wanted to mention that name because in the planning with all of the community members on those two bodies, the Children and Families Commission and the local Public Safety Coordinating Council, they arrived at that name because it lends itself to a couple of messages. Use prescription drugs safely, um, store them safely, which our district attorney would say means lock them up, and dispose of them safely. Years ago, we were taught to flush them down the toilet. We're not supposed to do that anymore. Um, our Police departments here in Salem and in Kaiser have year-round prescription drug turn-in mechanisms, and then we have a new a, a spring prescription drug turn-in event coming up on Saturday, April 27th. And then keep your children and, and uh, family members safe. So we also want to honor, we have some community members who have suffered the loss of a child in the last year um, due to this issue and the connection between prescription drug abuse and heroin, and those are the things that brought that to our attention. There will be two community meetings this month, one on Tuesday, April 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Kaiser Civic Center. And uh, we encourage anybody who is interested in joining us, it's free, it's open to the public, come early, come at 5.30, the doors will be open, we'll have coffee. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to join us that night. You'll hear a very detailed presentation that'll be actually from one of your Salem Police Detectives. And then there will be some treatment providers also who will be able to answer questions that any family members may have. And then there's also a second community meeting in Woodburn, and that'll be Thursday, April 25th, and also from 6 to 8 p.m. So we hope that by raising awareness and helping people understand the strange connection between these prescription opiates and heroin abuse, that we can just identify more and more ways to keep our children and family members and our seniors safe as well. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. If I could, um, there is also in the planning for Staten and um, where else? Jeff uh, Jeff looking at Jefferson, Jefferson. Mm -hmm. State and possibly Silverton. And the and the Kaiser one is a it's to serve the Salem Kaiser community. So please don't feel like it's only for Kaiser residents, but it's just how the planning has come together. Thank you again for allowing us to be here and share this information. And thank you for bringing awareness to this issue. Thank you. All right. Last but not least, our library. And as many of you know, the relationship with Salem Public Library and the community is a strong one, and it's one of history and heritage, and one that we celebrate because our city has, very, has several very strong foundations, but one of those is definitely our library. And I'm very excited this evening to present this proclamation and to introduce our special <coughs> guests. Let me first tell you who's here. We have, of course, BJ. Toey. I know. I'm thank you. Here. I do that every time. <laughs> BJ Toey, thank you, who is our library administrator and has been with the library a number of years. Yes. And Deborah DeHansick from Willamette University is head librarian at the university. You probably have a fancier title than that, don't you? It works. And our third guest is John Goodyear, who is with the Chemeketa Community Regional <laughs> Library, and he's the services director for that. So I'm going to read this proclamation on behalf of the city National Library Week 2013. Whereas libraries are at the heart of their communities, campuses, and schools, Whereas libraries throughout our area, including Salem Public Library, Chemeketa Cooperative Regional Library Service, Willamette University's Hatfield Library, and the Oregon State Library work together.
to make a difference in the lives of our residents. And whereas libraries are places of opportunity, supporting all forms of literacy and encouraging lifelong learning by promoting continuing education and through innovative programming and uses of technology. And whereas librarians work to meet the changing needs of our community, including providing access to resources for everyone and bringing services outside of the library walls. And whereas libraries continuously grow and evolve in how they provide for the needs of every member of our community. And whereas <coughs> libraries, librarians, library workers, and supporters at libraries of all types throughout the city of Salem and across America, America are celebrating National Library Week. Now therefore, be it resolved that I, Anna Peterson, Mayor of the City of Salem, proclaim National Library Week, April 14 to 20, 2013. I encourage all residents to visit your library this week to take advantage of its wonderful resources. Communities matter at your library. Congratulations to our librarians. Would you like to say a few words? It's so great to have wonderful partners to work with in this city because we all work together to bring library services to people of all ages. I do want to point out that Salem Public Library does do a food for fines where you can bring in cans of food that will donate to the Marion Pope Food Share <coughs> and take some of those fines off of your library card. So do visit us this week with your cans of food. It's a pleasure to be here. Many of you think of Willamette as a private institution, but in fact, we're very open to the public and we welcome the community. We have many community borrowers who come in, so don't hesitate at all to come and see us. We also serve the public on our um, homepage, our website, where you will see a number of historical collections that relate to Salem and the history of the West, because Willamette is the oldest institution of higher learning in the West, and we're very proud of that, but we're also very proud to be part of Salem. So thank you, Madam, for having, Madam uh, Mayor, for having us here. Thank you. We're very glad to have Salem Public Library as one of our members to strengthen our cooperative and provide a lot of resources to help us take care of all the patrons in the Mid Valley here. Thanks. Wonderful. I like thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Let's have a nice round of applause for you. Now we'll have public comment. I think we have quite a list. Oh, that's the one you wanted. I'm going to read a couple of names at a time so you can sort of be prepared so you know when you're coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scott Bassett and then Richard Reed. Good. Thank you, Mayor and City Councilors. My name is Scott Bassett, and I live in Ward 4. Although I work for ODOT, I am expressing my personal concerns about the Third Bridge staff report in Agenda Item 3.3D. In 2006, the Council began a two-year project going to cost $2 million to locate and finance a new bridge. It's now five years late and over $5 million over budget. It has been a bring me a rock exercise <clears throat> for picking a bridge extending now into seven years at a cost of almost $8 million to research nine alternatives and now you're proposing a 10th bridge proposal. The staff recommendation does not identify the cost nor how to pay for it. It does not identify the number of new bridge lanes or the impacts of possibly closing the Rosemont ramps and expanding Edgewater impacts further west to the new Eola interchange, to a proposed new Eola interchange. Although there are some well-intended modifications to the third bridge plan at Pine Street, it appears to be a first installment on a regional bypass since the main bridge structure is elevated above Front Street. The DEIS 
documents that increasing accessibility for West Salem shoppers to Kaiser Station could, and I quote, affect the relative importance of downtown area to the region and could alter the pace and location of future development, end of quote. We already have too many vacant front, uh, storefronts downtown. Prior studies looked at a new bridge and a new corridor at, at uh, Pine Street and concluded the costs were far in excess of available funds, that negative impacts were greater than benefits, and that signalized intersections at both ends of the bridge have more to do with traffic, con traffic congestion than the number of river crossing lanes. There are eight bridge lanes now that are used inefficiently during peak hours because traffic backs up onto the bridges from bottlenecks at Wallace Road, and the problem um, is stop signs like the one at Center Street off-ramp to northbound Front Street, which really should be replaced with a free-flowing uh, off-ramp. The staff proposal is likely to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and it does not even include a bike and pedestrian overpass of Wallace Road. Um, and uh, Wallace Road is going to be doubling in width from five lanes to nine lanes next year at the Glen Creek Interchange. It is ironic, it is ironic <coughs> that the scheduling for the public hearing, uh, hopefully that you'll change, uh, could, when you're going to talk about the largest um, highway expansion project in Salem's history on April 22nd. Mr. Bassett, I will have to call your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being with us this evening. All right, Richard Reed, and then following him, Mark Wig and Lauren Wells. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm Richard Reed. I'm at 3242 Bluff Avenue Southeast, Salem. And uh, I'm addressing a, a same agenda item 3.3D, the uh, proposed modification to the Salem River Crossing preferred alternative. Uh, my theme this time is about public participation. Uh, it's a prerequisite to public support. Uh, before we have another hearing on yet another bridge alternative, let's take some time to find out what the community wants. Before we go any further, isn't it reasonable to give neighborhood associations and all your constituents time to review the staff report on this latest bridge alternative? The hearing scheduled for April 22nd is impossibly close. Neighborhood associations and council wards need more than a month to review and comment on the third bridge planning. To make sure council represents a consensus, let's extend the timeline before the next hearing. We all agree that neighborhood associations play a vital role communicating with neighborhoods and bringing neighborhood consensus to council. Let's provide sufficient time to run this multi-million dollar decision by the taxpayers. In fact, a hearing may not be necessary. There doesn't seem to be any support for building a bridge. Both the SRC task force feedback and the DEIS comments that are included in the in the whole Salem River Crossing Library, as well as uh, the online public poll, none of these <coughs> indicate. Well, they all indicate there's no broad public support for any third bridge. It's just not there. The Salem River Crossing Task Force worked for six years and still didn't get a majority vote for any of the alternatives. Reviewing all the bridge testimony to council reveals only one comment supporting a third bridge. The latest alternative doesn't resolve any of the problems associated with all the other Salem River Crossing alternatives. Like those, this latest alternative will cost a pot of money. Should council vote before the public has had time to, under, to understand how much a bridge will cost or how it will be paid for? Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Reed? Thank you. Uh, Mark Wig and then Lauren Wells. Good evening. I'm Mark Wig. I live at 1950 Saginaw Street South in Salem. And um, I just wanted to address the issue of um, you uh, on the Salem River Crossing study, you've invested $7 million. You're committed to spending that. You've invested a lot of time, a lot of the community's energy. This is a sunk cost. One of the hardest things to do is to say, let's stop spending money. 
once businesses have a really hard time doing that, you start spending money on a project, you go, we gotta continue, we gotta continue. It's really hard to stop spending money once you've invested. But we're asking you to do that because this is a project that, according to this, the project's own information, it will make traffic worse than not building a bridge. Mm -hmm. That's not, this is coming out of the DEIS. Um, according to the DEIS, um, alternative 4A, which is similar to the one that's now being proposed, only 62% of the intersections will meet standards. The no build, it's 83% of the intersections will meet mobility standards. So you're gonna spend hundreds of millions of dollars or you're gonna ask the public to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a project that makes traffic worse. And when they talk about the delays from the DEIS, it's they say delays are terrible and they'll get better if we build a bridge, but they're only looking at delays to West Salem and back. They don't look at the delays that will occur to Kaiser. The intersections on Broadway and Commercial and Liberty going into Kaiser become much worse with this bridge project. So um, at some point, this project is gonna die. What I'm trying to, what I think we're trying to get you to do is realize that this project is doomed. You're not gonna really get the support from your public, from your constituents to vote for this bridge, but you're gonna spend millions more studying this problem. Let's work on actually solving the issues of congestion and get those solved without spending and wasting money. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Mr. Wig? All right. Thank you very much. Lauren Wells and then Wallace Reed. My name is Lauren Wells. I'm sorry. That's okay. Lorraine. My address is 2390 Liberty Street Northeast. I want to talk about the cloud. I bought my house in 1976, about the time the last Pine Street Bridge effort ended. Not long after that, talk and meetings began for the Front Street Bypass and the Parkway. This area was under the cloud for a number of years due to those projects. Speculators bought up much of the property here during those years. They did no maintenance. They rented the houses out to, out without much care who moved in. I experienced regular thefts, vandalism, pry marks on my doors and windows. I saw domestic violence, huge drug parties regularly going on, and dirty used needles dropped around in people's front yards. Houses deteriorated. Some were burned down by squatters. As soon as the parkway went in, most of those properties changed hands. Families with children started buying. They started making repairs and doing new landscaping. They were friendly. The thefts and vandalism stopped. <coughs> Business started up. New buildings went in. It has turned into a nice family neighborhood. Some houses were bulldozed because they could not be repaired. That property was put on the market. Some of it is still on the market, still vacant. Much of the empty land you see here is the result. The current bridge proposal would not be built immediately if the cloud comes back, I fully expect to be back to the felons, slumlords, and drug parties we had when I got here. Some of that is already happening. The houses on the northwest corner of Pine and Liberty are falling to ruin. One was never that great. The others had quiet renters and was kept in repair until the bridge talk started again. The cloud has real world consequences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? All right, thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Um, okay. Wallace Reed? Yes, welcome. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, City Council, my name is Wallace Reed. I live at 940 LaFell on the south edge of Bush's Pasture Park. <clears throat> and I'm here to urge your support of two items on your agenda having to do with Bush's Pasture Park. The first is item 3.2A. A year, yes, last uh, summer, a number of pieces of equipment for play 
all kinds of lovely things that everybody loved to have their grandkids or their kids or other things on disappeared or were taken out simply because of safety reasons. And the Scan Neighborhood Association, the Salem Parks Foundation, and the uh, parks operations of the city have formed a wonderful partnership, have begun raising funds for that. And this, um, if you approve the staff recommendation, would provide the opportunity to seek state funding for uh, at least getting started on this project. The second item, I'm here representing the Willamette chapter of the American Rhododendron Society and rhododendron lovers everywhere. This council in the, uh, October of 2010 accepted a wonderful donation from the Compton Family Foundation to begin what has become the rhododendron hillside in Bush's Pasture Park. It extends from the Winter LaFell's uh, intersection on the south to the Pioneer statue sort of in the middle of that south portion of the park. The blackberries are gone, the thimbleberries are gone, and roadies are blooming everywhere. It is a, just a beautiful, beautiful um, addition to that park. And so this will then, the uh, Compton Family Foundation has uh, again generously offered to donate funds to expand and improve this phase one which is just wonderful it's beginning to bloom right now come and see it mm -hmm. last thing is i would like to invite the council everyone in this room and everyone in tv land to come to the <laughs> celebration of this first phase at 1 30 p.m two saturdays off the 20th of april where we'll simply see the roadies in bloom in every direction and have fun enjoying each other's company and thanking everyone who was part and parcel to this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Are there questions or comments by counselors? Councilor Tesler. Thank you. In all the years I have known you, I have never seen you in a tie. <laughs> <laughs> you clean up really well. <laughs> when someone donates $48,326 you put on a tie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, I would like to just tell everyone how much work Wally Reed has put into the rhododendron garden. Um, Wally Reed can be seen scrambling underneath the bushes, picking up trash, setting up the trestles with the tape on them to tell people to stay off the newly planted grass, don't sled in the gardens. Um, there, you know, you, you have done so much for those gardens. It's crazy. And I remember the first time I met you, we had a very good conversation about Sappho, you know, the rhododendron. There are Sapphos planted. Yes, madam. I know. <laughs> and so I just really wanted to bring attention to Wally, who's just one of my um, heroes in Ward 2, does so much work. Wally and his wife, um, Kathy, just do so much wonderful work. I'm afraid I will not be there on the 20th of April. I'll probably be snook fishing somewhere near Naples, Florida. But um, I will think of you. We'll make sure Sappho blooms just on your behalf. Thank you all. It's been wonderful to work with the city on this project. So. Thank you, Mr. Reed. I'd like to offer offer an applause to you. I know you are famous in the community. Thank you for all your work. It keeps me off the street. <laughs> I'm sure that does. Now that it is one rather than the ground Yes. We have uh, Josh Graves and then Kenji, Kenji Sukahara. So yes, <laughs> did I do it right? Thank you, I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm teachable. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members. My name is Josh Graves and I live at 3190 Holiday Drive South. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Catholic Community Services and I'm highly involved in the Fostering Hope Initiative, which is a neighborhood-based, family-strengthening, collective impact initiative. Tonight I want to say thank you to all of you on the Council for supporting the Neighborhood Partnership Program. I want to especially thank Councilors Dickey and Thomas and City Staff Jessica Priest as well. We've seen a great collaborative effort come together through the Neighborhood Partnership Program and Fostering Hope. Vulnerable families in our city are getting stronger and family stress levels are decreasing through this effort. Evidence shows that parental stress is one of the key indicators resulting in abuse and neglect. Strong families and strong communities play an important role in reducing the stress. 
On behalf of all of the many Fostering Hope partners, we want to say thank you and that we appreciate the city's partnership. We look forward to continuing this work well into the future, and we've made a really great start, so thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Thomas. I, I'm sorry, Councillor Tesler. <laughs> I would be so honored to be you. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to thank you also for all the other good things that CCS does in the community, especially the Homes for Autistic Individuals, which I believe you're one of the few people who actually do those at the scale that you do them, and we so need those resources in our community, and I really like the um, disability um, communities that you've built, and um, you've really given a lot of people a chance to live in the community, and some of them even on an independent lifestyle, so just wanted to really thank Catholic Community Services for that, because you've really been a champion of that in the community and I very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate all the partnerships of the Fostering Hope Partners. It's much bigger than Catholic Community Services and I appreciate that very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Kenji is next. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Kenji Sugihara. I live at 1730 Misty Place Northwest and that's in West Hill. It's a little tall for me. I'm short. Sorry. So. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, uh, I've always wanted to say this, but I'm appearing on behalf of the West Salem Neighborhood Association today. Yes. So uh, the, what I'm going to speak about real quick is 3.3D, uh, which is the modifications to the Salem River Crossing Preferred Alternative. And uh, what I'm looking for is I'm not speaking against it or for it. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to request a little bit more time. Uh, you have the, the public hearing scheduled for the 22nd, and I request that it be moved to May 13th, uh, just solely so we can uh, take a look at it as a neighborhood association. Probably the same thing for SWAN, since their uh, next neighborhood association meeting is in May, correct? May for SWAN? All right, excellent. So uh, I just make that request. And then finally, the, the next thing I really I want to talk about real quick is... 3.3C, uh, which is the 25th Street, Southeast Madrona Avenue, Southeast, and that has to do with the road bonds. I just want to ensure that uh, the purchase of right away from Marine Drive hasn't fallen off the 2008 uh, Bridge and Road Bond uh, project list. So that's all that has to do. And then uh, one more thing, if you haven't had an opportunity to check out my video of the, uh, uh, of the state capitol and the bridges, uh, I, I know Annie will be able to get to that footage, but uh, it's, uh, it's a great thing to look at, and it really showcases what Salem's all about, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that. Ca uh, counselor's questions? Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Kenji, for coming down. Has the, um, I'm curious to ask this of a couple neighborhoods, if I could, have you guys considered the bridges at all yet? Yes. Okay, just looking at the existing, and so you're looking for more time so you can see what the proposed staff recommendation is? Correct. They're prior just, to the public hearing. Three, yeah, the, the new proposal that's coming around. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Kenji, thanks for your, your good comments and good work. I, I'd like to see this Bridges video. Um, if Council deliberates on the, the um, Third River Crossing, in April and likely in May, um, that will still give the Neighborhood Association enough time to consider it and then, I mean, you really just need to talk, not only, but the modifications are the main piece, is that correct? Correct. Uh, okay. We'd just like a little bit more detail in terms of uh, what the plan is actually going to look like, the number of lanes, where, where the bridge is going to land. But uh, if, if it's actually done twice, uh, if you have a public hearing twice, that's, that's fine. Just or we, we, a complex subject like that is likely going to be held you know, for at least another council meeting. And, and the, one yeah. of the concerns is, is that everybody get the same information about the modifications. Yeah. So yes. the public's need to know is really well served by having a public hearing. Correct. Uh, would you agree? Yes. Okay, thanks. Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Actually, uh, I'm glad you're here because this is spraying some good thought. Uh, along Councillor Clem's lines there was, uh, with the proposed staff recommendation that's here tonight, would the neighborhood association even have enough information to make a full consideration? Potentially. Uh, I mean, I'd definitely like to, I'll, I'll stay here and uh, take a look at it, but um, 
possibly. Okay, yeah, because I'm wondering if maybe along the lines of what Councillor Klein mentioned, we could open it mm -hmm. and then continue it just to get the discussion on the table. But anyway, just thinking out loud. Okay. Councillor Clem. I'm sorry, I had one more. It's all right. Um, thank you, Councillor Clausen. Uh, your last comment about Marine Drive still being streets and bridges bond measure. Mm -hmm. If Peter could help with an answer. Yes, Mayor, if I may, Peter Fernandez, yes. Public Works Director. Uh, the line item for uh, 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 right of way acquisition of third bridge or marine drive which is what the line item calls is still there so the savings are in addition to that okay that that line item is still budgeted at the 3.8 million dollars i believe is what uh, i might be quoting the number not quite correctly but that that line item is still there so the savings are over and above that okay all right other questions or comments thank you very much we appreciate you being here thank always you. Good to enjoy see you. your visit thank yep. you all right Rick Reitzman, and then John Christensen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council. Mm -hmm. I'm actually with Ward 2, or in Ward 2, but um, I'm here to speak on behalf of a, a staff report you're going to hear later tonight on. I think it's 7B, and that's the Neighborhood Partnership. And in Cessna, we were lucky enough to be one of the original partners and it's made a huge difference in my neighborhood. I live on 415 23rd Street. And um, through that partnership, we were able to gather our last meeting. We no longer are part of the city's partnership, but a partner, our partnership has been able to continue on because of the head of steam that was gathered up with your help. And last month, we had over 32 partners come to our table that we're pulling together to accomplish the good things that need to happen in our city because we can't really expect government to take care of everything. And years ago, when my wife and I started to work in our neighborhood, we were overwhelmed to the point we were going to quit. But then we were lucky enough to have a cup of coffee with Jessica Price. And uh, she explained to us about what the partnership looked like. And um, I guess she hooked me. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I'm here again on that behalf that you guys would keep that as a viable um, project even though it's with you guys not with us anymore which I was really ticked off when you stole it from us but that's okay <laughs> so thank you again thank you so much Councillor Dickey Thanks for coming down and sharing about that because you are the model of what the program is intended to do is to actually kind of plant that seed so that the neighborhood is able to take ownership of that and move ahead with that. And so thank you so much for your work on that. And um, I guess you might have been the one to initially work on applying for it in the first place. Um, but then being willing to carry that on after you didn't have the program. So um, you guys are an excellent model for other neighborhoods who might want to participate in the future. Thank you. Excellent. Lord, uh, Councillor Tesler. Thank you. Um, I can remember the, my very first time I came to a Cessna Neighborhood Association and we talked about how much crime and problems and everything else there was. And the last Cessna Neighborhood Association I was uh, at, the officer said, well, you know, uh, I really don't have anything to report. And that was just music to my ears at that point because I can remember sitting there for a half hour listening to a long list of occurrences. And you know, that's, this is exactly what we should be doing as a city. We should be enabling people with these partnership programs and then pulling out and letting people take care of it from there because they know best how to serve their neighborhoods and giving them the guidance and the help they need when they need it to come in. But originally, at first, you do need an intensive effort but it's a negative log scale where you put in a lot of money up front and then over time it goes down. So Cessna and Highland um, have been really good examples of this, but it takes the people within the neighborhood to step up and be involved and you definitely have been one of those people along with a lot of other people in Cessna. And so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you and this is exactly what we should be doing. You know, we should enable people to get in there and take care of business and then turn it over to them and let them drive. So take the keys, drive away. Yeah. I was kind of kidding around when I said that Jessica hooked me, but you know, it's that whole adage about teach a man how to fish and you can feed him for a lifetime. And that's, I think what you guys have done in our neighborhood 
you know, allowed us to expand. We used to just take care of the Cessna area, a small little geographic area. Now we take care of the entire South Salem High School catchment yeah. area or the whole um, wow. feeder district for yeah. South Salem High School. And we start, I think we had about a $3,000 budget back then, six years ago or something. I believe this year we're working with 35000 in our budget. Wow. But that's just hard cash. That doesn't count in kind contributions because we don't, do anything without at least equal. We need the partnership, the neighbors to step up to it. That's just an excellent story. You just make my heart sing. Oh. Thank you so much. Are there other comments or questions from counselors? All right, thank you so much. We appreciate you, all that you do. All right, John Christian, no, I'm not saying it right. John Carlston? It's John Christensen. It's, it is Christensen, it's Danish. welcome. People say Christian, but it's Kristen. 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 Yes, it is, isn't it? All right. It's like Pedersen and Peterson. <laughs> let's, not get, let's not go there. I, I think yeah. you fully understand. Um, I'm here to also th say, for the record, John Christensen, I serve as the co-chair of the SCAN Parks Committee, uh, myself and a young attorney named Tyler Malstrom. Tyler and I talked this evening before I came down. And we want to thank council for item 3.2A, dealing with the regional park, Bush Pasture Park, and the restoration and uh, rehab of the Crooked House Playground. I specifically want to thank our counselors, Councilor Tesler, Councilor <coughs> Benars. Benars, right. I prefer to say Warren. It's easier. Um, but there are also some other folks that I want to say thank you to, and that's the city manager, Mr. Fernandez, Mr. Bechtel, Keith Kiever. All of these are partners. Uh, we don't call ourselves partners in the same way as you heard before, but we are. I'd also like to thank Betty, uh, Betsy, excuse me, Belshaw. Dr. Pedersen, Gary Pedersen, Dr. Dan Sosi, Linda Beardley, Carol Suzuki, the Compton family, Salem Clinic, who came forward and donated $5,000 to rehab of the playground, um, State Representative Brian Clem, spelt the same as our counselor, who donated $1,200. Uh, two of our Kiwanis clubs in town, uh, Deborah Kororski, uh, McRae Carmichael, let's see, I don't want to forget Kathy Reed, who's done an excellent job, and um, Thomas Smith. So thank you very much. I know enough about government, government, to know that these things don't move forward unless there's staff working hard and council individuals and city managers and our counselors encouraging things to move forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Are there comments or questions from counselors? Well, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Mary Ann Beery and then uh, Carrie Maynou. I know I'm not saying that correctly. Mary Ann? Good evening, Welcome. Madam Mayor and Council. My name is Mary Ann Byrne. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm here to speak on behalf of agenda item, I see 3.3D, is it um, on the bridge? And um, I, I'm sort of a newer person to Salem. I moved here from Seattle. So when everyone thinks that there's traffic on the bridge here, I think you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and to look at the price tag and the huge project that's being put forth for this plan, to me, is like, I can't see spending this kind of money for the, and I don't see the purpose of it. What's interesting is I've been reading, wearing this button that says no third bridge on it as I travel around. I, I live by the fairgrounds. I'm in uh, Ward 5. And um, people ask me, they go, what's that for? I says, well, do you know about the third bridge? And they go, what third bridge? I'm finding there's a lot of people in this town who are absolutely clueless that this council is about to spend as much money as is put forth here to build a bridge that is not required because there isn't the traffic to support it. 
nor is there the kind of commerce going through to support the traffic. And so I'm here to say I'm against this bridge. And I think you folks are wasting a lot of your time and our time by continuing on with this. So I would like to ask that you actually just stop the process. It's a waste of time and a waste of money. And it's not necessary. So that's what I would like to say for today. And I've been to all the working sessions. And from everything I'm hearing and all the statistics and all the maps, um, it's not necessary. This bridge is not necessary. And we don't need to spend the money. And we have a lot of people, as a new person also to this town, who's about to go and basically is on fixed income. Um, there's a lot of people in this town who are older and who are on fixed income. The last thing they want to see is a rise in their property taxes. So I'm, again, I, it's almost like I want to say, the emperor has no clothes. Can't you see it? We don't need this bridge, not as it's proposed. We don't need a, a monstrosity going over and, and wiping out the neighborhood over there by pine and hickory. And we don't need a huge exp elevated expressway going across West Salem and ruining all those neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions or comments from counselors? All right, thank you very much. Carrie Mayhew is next. Now that I see your name more clearly on the, on the sheet, thank you for coming. I think it was coming. my writing. I think it was my writing. No, it's um, my eyesight, but I'm pleased to see you here. It's been a while. Yes. Thanks for coming. Good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, council members. Um, my comments tonight are praises for the City of Salem Partnership Program. Um, it's so exciting to have had um, you know, one of these, well, actually two of these in the McKay High School feeder area. Um, and to have the amazing support that we have gotten through Jessica and also Cheryl and Diana. I mean, it's just been an amazing, amazing project. Piggybacking on what Rick had to say is that that particular model with South Salem Connect has really influenced our direction. And we're very grateful for um, them coming before us and kind of leading the charge. We're on our second um, partnership cycle with the East Lancaster neighborhood area, and we've I included a very enthusiastic NOLA neighborhood in that process. So we're really looking forward to expanding that table. And through part of the, I'm just gonna give you a couple little snapshots of, of how those partnerships have worked in the neighborhoods, but in the East Lancaster neighborhood, they helped support a community dinner that provided 8,000 meals last year on Wednesday evenings with a very diverse community of folks um, attending those meals. They also provided play days, um, block parties, free soccer programs for the children in the neighborhood, holiday parties, and these were all um, requests of the neighborhood folks through surveys we took. Now a snapshot of the Lansing neighborhood would have, is that that particular group of folks wanted to see how to better connect the neighborhoods. And we did that through starting weekly coffee hours at a little resource house in the neighborhood called La Casita, promoting children's lending library that was in the neighborhood. And that was actually BJ, um, has been a big influence through our partners with Reading for All in that process. So it was exciting to see that proclamation um, tonight presented to the council. So, um, and I think the important piece of this is putting faces to it for you. And in the, the framework of the Lansing neighborhood where they really felt a priority was to bring the neighbors together to connect, was that there was a family in, that had moved into the neighborhood that the school called us about. They emailed me because a family had just gotten housing and had nothing. We had a coffee hour where there were neighbors and um, community folks present, and at the end of that coffee hour, that family of three with a child in McKay High, in Waldo and Washington Elementary that had beds, cooking utensils, and furniture for that home. So that just goes to show you how bringing people to connect through relationship and things happen. 
And this is the beauty and the face of that neighborhood partnership. And thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. You've been an uh, instrumental person in the community, and I just appreciate so much your passion and your devotion to others. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment and ask Jessica to please stand so that we can recognize yes. Jessica Priest. Jessica. Yay. Brady Rogers is the uh, supervisor, I believe. Brady is over here. And Brady, thank you for the leadership that you continually show in so many aspects of community development, and you do a lot to help strengthen our community. I also want to say kudos to Councilors Dickey and Thomas and to Councilor Tesler. When these partnership programs are established in neighborhoods, the counselors are an important part of the picture. And thank you. I know you've attended many meetings. You've talked with people. You've really made the program known throughout the community. And so from, from me as the mayor, I want to tell you that that's feet on the street out in your wards and in those neighborhoods truly brings Salem, the, the city of, of peace, to the community. Thank you very much for what you do. We have one last person who signed up, Nancy Donaldson. Nancy, are you still with us? There you are. All right. Good evening, Mayor Peterson and the council members. My name is Nancy Donaldson, and I live at 2747 Front Street, right at the end of Tryon. Does that give you some idea why I'm here? Mm -hmm. Do I want them to tear my house down to put a bridge up? I've lived there for 25 years. The other thing, too, that I have to say is they've got an amount of bridges downtown where it wouldn't hurt to build another bridge right beside them. Why string those bridges down that river? We have a lot of wildlife. I have deers in my, deer in my yard quite frequently. I like living there. I don't want to move. I may live five years, 10 years. I'm 72 years old. But I don't want to uproot at this time in my life. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Are there questions by, from counselors? Thank you for coming this evening. We appreciate your, your preparation and, and your attendance. All right, that concludes the um, public comment section. And I'm going to ask if uh, we can have a little stretch for a moment here. And people maybe who have already testified, if, you, if you'd like to leave the chambers, you certainly feel free to do that. You do not have to stay for the entire meeting. Counselors, you do have to stay. <laughs> we'll take a break. <laughs>
3.3C by Bernards and 3.3D by Dickey. Would you please repeat the one, the last two? For Councillor Dickey was which one? Uh, Councillor Bernards is uh, 3.3C. 3.3C for Bernards and which one for Councillor? 3.3D. D for Tesler? For Dickey. Dickey. Were there any polls for Councillor Tesler? Yes. yes, Tesler polled 3.3B. Uh, oh, we have two people. Okay. Yeah, D? we changed. We changed. We changed. 3.3B will be polled by Tesler. Thank you. you. You bet. Sorry. That's all right. We've got it now. All right. A. Is there a second? No. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Nanke to approve the consent calendar with the following polls. 3.2B, Councillor Tesler. 3.2C, Councillor Clausen. 3.2C, Councillor Bednarz. And 3.2D, Councillor Dickey. 3.3. I'm sorry, 3.3D, Councillor Dickey. All right. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. <sighs> All right. We yeah. will proceed to our uh, public hearing. We have one public hearing this evening, and we have two people who've signed up to speak. And with the city court recorder, please introduce the public hearing. The Salem City Council will now hold a public hearing to receive testimony regarding the proposed projects and financing measures in the preliminary fiscal year 2013, 2014 through 2017 and 2018 capital improvement plan. Thank you, and we have a staff report. And this Welcome. is oh. David Lacey from Administrative Services Department. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm David Lacey from the Administrative Services Department, and I'm here tonight to present the Preliminary Capital Improvement Plan for fiscal years 2013, 2014 through 2017, 2018. The Capital Improvement Plan is a citywide effort, and I want to thank all of the department directors, engineers, analysts, and personnel who provided the project details contained in this plan. A Capital Improvement Plan, or CIP, is a five-year plan for capital spending. Like a budget, the CIP matches expected revenues with planned expenditures. But unlike a budget, the CIP has a multi-year timeline, which is helpful when planning large expenditures or projects that may span multiple years. Preparation for the CIP is governed by Council Policy C9. In addition, ORS 223309 requires that projects financed by systems development charges be part of an adopted financial plan. A CIP such as ours can be used to fulfill this requirement. CIP projects are identified in many ways, including assessment of current infrastructure, needs and repairs, expansion of existing infrastructure, and citizen involvement in identifying needs within the community. While many projects have been approved by council and completed through the CIP planning process, I would like to share three recently completed projects to illustrate how projects move through the CIP process. The first project example is Hoodview Park, which showed up two years ago in the 2011 CIP. It was known as Kale Road Park during the pre-development phase. The park was funded with system development charges and was completed this past winter. Here's a view of some of the playground equipment. The tile surfacing around the play structures is a spongy rubber material that exceeds both ADA and impact standards. The park contains three separate play areas, age-appropriate play areas, two three-point basketball courts, surface trails, benches, and picnic tables. The next CIP project example I'd like to share is actually a group of projects, uh, the railroad crossing safety improvements. 
In May 2010, Council approved 10 projects at the crossings from Sunnyview Road Northeast south to Mill Street Southeast. The goal was to improve vehicle and pedestrian safety as well as proceed through the process of establishing a 1.7 mile railroad quiet zone upon completion. The projects were funded as part of the 2008 Streets and Bridges Obligation Bond Measure. This slide shows the pedestrian improvements uh, looking east at Sunnyview Road. The improvements include flashing light signal assemblies at the pedestrian crossing, ADA compliant detectable warning surfaces, and thermoplastic stop here warnings. This slide shows, a vehicle, uh, shows the vehicle safety improvements at the crossing on Sunnyview Road, again looking towards 17th Street. Improvements include 100 foot raised non-traversable curbs on each approach which defer drivers from driving around the crossing gates, as well as upgrading siding and striping. And the final completed project I'd like to present tonight is the intersection improvements at Market Street Northeast and Lancaster Drive Northeast. The project widened the intersection to reduce congestion and now um, provides two left turn lanes from eastbound Market Street to Lancaster Drive, which is pictured above, two left turn lanes from northbound Lancaster to westbound Market Street towards I-5, a second through lane westbound on Market Street, and widening of all the approaches necessary to receive those additional lanes. The traffic signals were modified and also new curbs and sidewalks were installed. I'll now move on to the details of the forward-looking projects in the, C in the preliminary CIP. The preliminary CIP consists of capital projects that are expected to cost $104.9 million over five years. This slide displays the CIP expenditures by funding source for the five-year CIP. The largest funding source is rates revenue, which represents 36% of the CIP. General obligation bonds uh, represent and is the next largest at 22. Systems development charges at 17%, and all other sources are about a quarter of the CIP. Funding from the general fund, shaded red, represents less than half of a percent of the total CIP. This chart provides another way to look at CIP expenditures by their project groups. The utilities projects, uh, shaded dark blue, represent 45% of the CIP, or $48 million. Utility projects are for stormwater, wastewater, and water infrastructure, and are funded primarily by rates revenue. The transportation projects, shaded light blue, represent 40% of the CIP, or $42 million over five years. Transportation projects are for street-related infrastructure and are funded primarily by the general obligation bonds approved by voters in 2008. The municipal facilities projects, shaded gray on the graph, represent 11% of the CIP, or 12 million. The projects include various facilities and equipment owned and operated by the city that are necessary to support city services. The community facilities projects uh, represent 4% of the CIP, or 4 million. Projects in this group are for various facilities operated by the city that provide educational, cultural, and recreational opportunities. The next four slides expand just each on the groups that we just talked about. This first slide is for community facilities and it just shows what's in, in it with the historic structures, library, and parks. The municipal facilities include the airport, fire, information technology, and parking structures. Transportation is a standalone group. And finally, the utilities, uh, which include, again, the stormwater, wastewater, water, and also, utility, also some facilities that are common to all of the utilities. One additional project has been added to the preliminary CIP since it was received by council back on March 25th. Construction of the Minto Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge and Trail is now included in the CIP since the majority of the project funding has been identified. The project details are located on page 29 of the preliminary CIP document under the transportation project group. Specific details for all projects can be found in the preliminary CIP document attached to the staff report as well as the city website. The link can be found by selecting departments, finance, and then CIP. In addition to the preliminary CIP document, the CIP website contains supplemental information to help identify individual projects. The GIS team, which includes personnel from Information Technology and Public Works, uh, will be updating the interactive CIP project map to help give a visual representation of the adopted projects by type and location. Users will be able to click on project icons, the project details will appear in a pop-up box, and they can select ward boundaries, neighborhood boundaries, current project lists, and also type their address in to be able to find out what projects are nearby. 
Although the CIP reflects funded projects, the staff report includes a brief discussion of unfunded projects in the form of the unfunded project list, referenced as attachment B. Projects remain on the unfunded list until a funding source is identified or becomes available. As you can see from the chart here, um, the total is roughly 262 million in unfunded projects that have been identified. And this concludes the staff presentation for the preliminary CIP. And staff recommends that council adopt the preliminary CIP and representatives from city departments are available to answer any project detail questions. Thank you very much. We appreciate such a complete and very understandable report. Yes. That's very, very well good. done. Yay. 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 Very, very well done. Thank you. We have two individuals signed up this evening, Cindy Astley and then Jeff Rudder. Madam Welcome. Mayor, City Councilors, my name is Cindy Astley and I live at 4055 Alana Avenue Southeast and I represent my neighbors and my neighborhood. Our neighborhood is not connected to the storm sewer system. This creates hazards in our area every year. Each year rain pools on the corners of Moonlight and Alana creating a dangerous lake where people hydroplane and damage our front yards because we have no curbs either. Um, when I bought my property in June of 2005, I didn't know the danger that was waiting for me that stormy winter in 06, to the tune of $7,459. Water pooled in this intersection, soaking my front yard and draining into my house. I had to wait till the summer to do some remediation and spent the first year in my house with no heat. A temporary sump pump was installed to get the water out, but it was just an endless cycle going back into the road, flooding back into my house. The lake appears every year regardless of the amount of water, and the hydroplaning of the cars is a huge concern. To add to this concern, we are mere one block from Fay Ride Elementary. Families and small children use these arterials daily to access school, and the area is just not safe. This past winter, heavy rains had five of my neighbors, including myself, exiting water from our properties. My neighbor located on 360 Moonlight created a pipe system because all the water went into his front yard and he pumped it to Lone Oak. Lone Oak is attached to the sewer system. This is ridiculous and we live with this every year. The intersection um, has been a capital improvement project for years, but we've never made the cut. Our last CIP number is 60745. Total investment of 280,000 never came our way. I have talked with public works. I have talked with the storm team. I have talked with supervisors and I have talked to council. My first glimmer of hope was when Councillor Bednars came out with specs on what the city believed to be true in my area. Within 30 minutes, it was determined that the city's information was not there and not complete. There is no drainage ditches, there is no connective system, and there is nowhere for the water to go. My, neighbor and I, my neighbors and I all work, we all pay taxes, we all know there's an increase, but we have no benefit from the taxes that we pay and the proposed taxes that we will pay in the future. Our neighborhood is worth it, and we implore you to take action on the chip for the CIP, sorry, I add an H every time, for Alana and Moonlight. Um, like I said, I'm representing my neighborhood, and I have signatures from my neighbors. The pictures that I've handed around are just from around my property, and that was this year. The first picture is the side of my house farthest away from the intersection. The water flows into the backyard, around to the other side of the house, dig a little ditch, and it slides out to the road. The sump pump that you see there in the uh, right lower corner is from underneath of the house. And the second page, you can see the lake growing in the uh, intersection. This happens every year. Thank you. I'm sorry. I do have to draw your attention to the red light. I'm very sorry that, that your situation is so bad. I had no idea until I saw these pictures. All right. Are there questions by counselors? Councilor Benares? 
Cindy, thank you for coming down here. I actually haven't been there when it's been raining so badly, but I have walked the area completely. How far is, is uh, the Fayrite storm system from your home? How far would they have to go with that, that drain line? One block. One block. And, you, and, and in your neighborhood, you said you had a pump underneath your house. Do you, all your neighbors have pumps underneath their houses? My two block street, which is Atlanta, um, it's off of Browning and it dead ends into Queen of Peace. Of those uh, nine neighbors, seven of us have pumps. And in fact, I have three. And it sounds like that water, you pump it out and it just returns? Just returns because there's nowhere to go. So there's a pervious surface, but they're using the, uh, the, the area underneath your home as the area that's pooling the water. Correct. Huh. Wow. The testimony earlier tonight about neighbors getting together, <laughs> We were pretty ingenious this year and pumped it to Lone Oak because it was it was pumping out and then pumping back in and pumping out and pumping back in. There was nowhere to go. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Are there other questions? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Bennett. Uh, which uh, is it? Is it uh, Lone Oak or Browning where the? Uh, Browning is the main arterial, but Alana Avenue. Um, is my street and right. Moonlight intersects with Lone Oak. Yeah, I see so that. Browning so and, and Moonlight inter intersect. Where is the, uh, the, where is the storm drain system from here? It's on Lone Oak. It's on Lone Oak. So it's basically right across from Fay Wright Elementary, which ah, is okay, a block from me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you've it's, been here before. I've not testified in front of. Me yet, so I yeah. haven't heard from I've you usually before. been here for work. This is just personal. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I hadn't heard of this one before, and it's real. Yeah. It's a real concern that this has gone on for so many years without any of us being contacted. So I appreciate you coming down. Well, thank you very much. Um, it took us a while to figure out what we were doing and talking and yeah. getting nowhere. And really, this last winter was huge. We all took time off of work. We were all helping each other out. Yeah. And in my crawl space, I have about a 1,600 square feet. And I had one sump pump already working. And I put two more in that day. And the water was about an inch from soaking my insulation again. Oh, geez. So you times that by the depth down and the amount of square feet. It was about 76,000 gallons of water just in my property alone. Well, I'm glad you found your way here to this hearing because this is, uh, this I is I just exactly what early. this hearing is for, is to hear from people where they're having this kind of problem. So it's really good. Thank you. I, I'm glad I got the chance to talk to you. Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is it possible for Ms. Astley and staff to have a conversation about the problem or is, is, is staff well aware? Well, actually, of I just uh, I appreciate the staff, my staff being here. This project is actually on page 35 of the preliminary CIP. It's project 60745, but it's funded for, it's, it's, it's out two years. Yeah, so, it, so it's still out two years, uh, but it is, you know, it, it by virtue of being the CIP, it's on its way up, but it's, not quite up yet. Mr. Fernandez, is this the item 60745? That's the one. OK, thanks. That's the one. If you, if you look at the description there, it yeah. speaks to, to Moonlight and, and Alina. So, so, so it, the, the issue is identified. Uh, it's just what uh, we struggle with, you know, with every project, you know, just moving you know, there's only so much money. There's issues all over the place. It's just moving the money around to get to them just as quickly as we can. All right. Other councilor comments? Councilor Bernard? My question actually was to staff, and it, 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 it was After. afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to staff in a moment. Councilor Clausen? I'll wait, too. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We really appreciate you coming. I would coming. like to leave my photos. testimony since my neighbors signed. Who do I give mm -hmm. that to? Mm -hmm. And that will become part of the record. Thank you very much. Good. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, if uh, staff would like to return, I think we have some counts. Of I think you had one more person, Jeff Reuter. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, we do have. Jeff, welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Councilors. Um, I'm also here to talk about flooding, but I am uh, wanting to speak about item 61262 in the uh, 
preliminary capital improvement plan, which I believe is also on page 35. Uh, I live in the area that would be affected by that project, and I uh, want the, to urge the council to adopt that part of the plan. Um, I was very happy to see the, um, the proposed funding for improvements to uh, the flooding situation near Walnut Creek in the area of Woodside Drive, and that also includes Marstone Court, where I live. Uh, I know it's difficult to um, balance the needs of these various projects. Um, and I really think this is an investment that will pay dividends for the city. Uh, my house flooded twice in 2012. I very much agree that this area has experienced persistent flooding issues for at least the past uh, five years and probably the past decade. Um, and I'm pleased to see that it's included in the CIP. So I wanted to uh, thank the counselors and the public works department for its inclusion. Thank you. Are there questions by counselors? All right. Thank you. We appreciate your coming. All right. I believe we do have questions of staff. Welcome back to the podium. All right. Staff, uh, excuse me, counselors, questions? Councilor Benares? Just curious, when a house floods, or the, when a house floods and damages insulation and or ducking, the water gets into the ducting and they have to replace this, whose shoulders does that liability fall on? It, it, it's on the property owners. It's the property owner's responsibility. So the rain comes off our streets, goes into their yard, and it becomes the property owner's problem. That is correct. Hmm. Councillor Clausen and then Councillor Nanke. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I've got a couple questions, so I'll split them up so we can get everybody else in, too. Um, on the Moonlight one, I'm interested in that. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, or staff, as is right for the question, is the issue just that there's no storm drains in the street, so we need to install you know, I, new pipe I, and drains? That's what it sounds like, is that we would need to run storm drains. I'm not, I'm not personally familiar with, with the project, but, but obviously it's, it's been identified and, and we're aware of it. It's just a matter of you know, having it, you know, come to come forward to the first year so we can uh, okay. fund it and uh, and get it construct designed and constructed. Okay. Um, if I may, on another one, and I'll yes, go I'll ahead. take a break. Um, I was wondering if. Um, well, first off, I have to say thank you to staff. This CIP process is a huge undertaking for staff. I know it is, but I'll tell you what, it's absolutely critical to us maintaining our infrastructure. Absolutely critical. We have to see five years out. We have to plan out like that. And um, you know, it's, it's a very good process that we do, and I really appreciate what we have in this. Um, so I guess my biggest question uh, has to do with, well, I'll just throw it out there. Can can you give me a brief description of the ranking? I guess that's the biggest thing, just to help us out with understanding. I mean, we have the unfunded list at 200 million almost, and I see 112 million of water projects and infrastructure. Can you just, you know, maybe the two-minute condensed version of the ranking? What? How do we make it onto the list, and sure. how do we move it up to make sure it's in this next year, and so sure. on? Sure. So, so for um, for the transportation projects that are funded through the bond. Uh, that had its own process mm -hmm. that we undertook a very extensive uh, community outreach in 06 and 07 to determine those projects and then we just laid them out over a number of years to, to deliver the projects. Uh, for the utility projects, uh, we run uh, an asset management styled process and we just look for uh, either the uh, you know bad situations or you know pipes that are deteriorated or the needs of the utility at the time, and then just just lay it out uh, based on how much money we have, our ability to deliver the projects, and uh, 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 and that's that's what we propose for you. The the limitations that we have, and and, and you know that you know which is stormwater is the emerging issue in in our community you know we're, we're we had two floods uh this past year 
and uh, were chasing these issues all over town. A lot of a lot of bad design in the 70s. A lot of bad decisions that we're now chasing to to correct. Uh, so a lot of that is just limited by funding. Uh, there's only so much money in the utility that we can spend on uh, on 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 capital improvements. And then the other limiter is the ability of our engineering staff to get to it because the engineering staff is not only doing stormwater, but is doing wastewater and water and transportation and fire stations and parks and they, they do it all. So we just have to slot them in to, uh, to get them delivered uh, just as quickly as we can. Uh, I will say that we leverage quite a bit of our efforts with consultants and contractors, et cetera, but we still need to be uh, the project managers and the owner's representatives in uh, in, in these processes. So, so there's, there's no magic to them. Uh, you know, you could, I, I certainly understand Ms. Astley's issue, who, who would want to live in that situation. Uh, if we shuffle it around and move that project up, another project will be shuffled back because there's only so much time and so much money. So it's really just a matter, of, you know, we could get into that level of detail, but it's really, that's all, that's what it boils down to. Thank you. Follow up, if I may. Yes. Uh, so then, could you describe? And this might actually go to a little bit more facilities, um, but if we have a project that's identified to happen this next year, a year out, and I know we're not going to be perfect on predicting when something is going to fail, but I'm assuming one, if something has a 20-year life, we're not replacing it at year 20. We're right. going to start budgeting for it and replace it when it fails. Uh, what is our flexibility? Sometimes we replace it in year 100. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. But what is our flexibility of when that project, when something fails, that's number you know, six, so it's six years out. What is our flexibility for that? Does that have to come back to council for an uh, amendment to the CFP? Uh, no, what you will usually see is a mid-year project creation. So, so for example, in your, uh, in your, uh, I don't think it's in, it's in your list, but we, Councilor Benars and I were, were talking about it. We are doing the project to replace the water line under I-5 mm -hmm. at uh, Marietta. Mm -hmm. uh, that project came out of the blue. ODOT called us and said, hey, we're doing this project, get out of our right of way. Yeah. And uh, you know, we have to fund that to get out of the right of way. So, so you'll see projects, we plan them, and that's what the CIP is for. Those projects either come from our master plans or they come from issues that, that are identified. What happens sometimes in this issue of a project may linger in year two or year three is that all these other needs that become more a priority come in, such as you know, an ODOT, ODOT calls us and now we got to do it, or, or a pipe that we hadn't anticipated failing fails, or any number of things can, can economic development project, you know, hey, big companies come into town, we got to rush and get a street improved. And uh, that's just the reality of our, of our lives here. And uh, so, so, so what tends to happen, unfortunately, is that smaller projects like the one that would help Miss Astley tend to get pushed back because of, because of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Nanke and then Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And my question was similar to what we've talked about, because we've been playing with this on a couple other pieces of property this year, and I want to thank Public Works for helping us get a couple of those resolved where you have multiple sump pumps under people's house, and if it starts raining, it's like, I have to go home and plug in my sump pumps now. Um, it's an awful feeling in life. Yeah. So the question is- I hope with that the, gentleman's property is working. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I haven't and, heard anything. And, and let so. me say, let me. Let, 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 I'm, I, I apologize, Councilor Nanke. When, when we have issues, and, and Councilor Nanke, speaking of a property owner that had a horrible situation, oh. he had 20 acres draining into his basement. Mm -hmm. So I mean, he had a horrible situation. The fix was small enough that we we had we were able to have operational units address that issue. So when when it's small enough that it doesn't require design. We can do it, you know, just by showing up and doing, you know, just th shooting some grades and getting it done. When a project is big enough, and usually when you have to crack the ground open and put pipes in, then it really requires engineering. And when it requires engineering, that's when it becomes a little more complex, and that's where you know we have to come through the CIP process and and, and do it that way. And that's a perfect lead-in because the question would be if this is a two-year-out project. How fast could one actually get the engineering done to actually, and then construction? Is it really two years out, no matter yeah, what we it's, do? It's, it's really just a resource issue. So what, so what we would have to do, I mean, if council wanted to direct us to move this project up, we would have to look 
at our workload, you know, and, and, and something would have to shift. Uh, we do that all the time. I, I will tell you that we had a project, we had a, a schedule laid out for streets and bridges, and we have shifted out Skyline, the yeah. improvement of Skyline, mm -hmm. the improvement of the uh, traffic control room upstairs, because other projects have shown themselves that had to get done sooner, so right. we've shifted projects out. So, you know, we look to the policy body to tell us, hey, no, this one's important, and then we will shift around. We'll just tell you what needs to be shifted, and, and then we'll do it. It's just, it's just money and time. Because from a priority perspective, it's like we are, let me phrase this properly for the city attorney. Um, <laughs> there's a property that's being damaged um, and we have the ability to fix that. And I'm sure some of the other items on the CIP, while there may be some risk, there's, there's not damage that's being done to someone and I would like to see us prioritize those things where we're making someone else's life a living hell. So I don't know how we say, find us what you're gonna offset it with. Um, Yes, you could, if council wanted to make a motion to have staff come back and say if we were going to move this project up, what would move back? We can or, do or just direct us to move the project up and then yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, yeah. we'll figure it out. I mean, I, something will give and, and it's not, sure. we're not going to play the game of, oh, we're going to show up with a marquee project and make you feel bad. I mean, we just, oh no, you know, we're, we're here to do projects. We're here to help people. It's just, yeah. it's just. Slotting in the budget and slot, slotting in the, the personnel resource. That's all it is. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Bennett, you had a question? I did, Madam Mayor. I, uh, Councillor Nanke, uh, I think, helped me with along with uh, Public Works Director Fernandez uh, sort of understand it. But uh, one of the concerns I have is we all have projects in our wards and in our neighborhoods where we're dealing with a variety of problems. I think back onto problems I've had at my house uh, with, I, I have a sump pump. Uh, I had a, a collapsed sewer line running up 16th Street or close to, or welded shut manhole covers. I never was real clear which was the problem, but the resulting physics of water and effluent uh, was problematic in my basement and finally got fixed as part of the CIP process. I've got that kind of stuff all over my ward and I, I am reluctant when we start moving things around. I think this is kind of unbelievable it's gotten this bad, but I, I'd like to understand the timing and I, I guess I would be interested in hearing how uh, the counselors involved here would like to resolve this you know, because they know their neighborhoods, they know what's important. I haven't had a chance to figure out what I'd trade out out of my ward, which is loaded with sewer and water and stormwater issues. And I, I, I assume there's been a lot of work done on this to develop a plan for moving this up, because this is really pretty striking, this situation. So I'm looking forward if there is a motion to what that trade looks like and where it comes from and how it's been determined because this has been a pretty uh, pretty well thought out plan and I like everyone else compliment you on it so I, I look forward to how this would be resolved and how people want to move stuff around. Councillor Clem. Thank you Madam Mayor. I, uh, I joined Councillor Bennett's interest in how we reprioritize here on council floor. Um, I don't know that w with the eight, eight wards that uh, a lot of us it could, if under close examination, list a number of water, stormwater, sewer projects. I think it would be helpful for some of us to understand the priorities that, you know, the, the system that led to the score. I have complete confidence in the CIP process. Um, the issue at hand is this is Pandora's box. We want to open it up. It, it, it's about the whole city, not, not any one property. And so while I grieve over the, the flooding that's gone on, I've got 10 stories just like it. Um, and I'm very concerned that what maybe we should do between now and the time we pass the budget is better understand the CIP and then come forward 
with, if we think we need to change it, do that at that time, but, but not tonight. I, I, I just, it's a very complex subject. Councillor Chesler and then Councillor Benares. Thank you. Well, I'm getting to be a moss back like these two gold guys because I've been around here a while too. And I can remember when I first came on, my good friend, Councillor Bruce Rogers, said, if you want to take something off the CIP list, you better make sure to take something off your list in return. And you know, I got a long list too. I got McGill Crest without sidewalks. I got flooding in my neighborhood. Um, you know, we have all kinds of issues in Ward 2 that I would love to, you know, apply CIP to. So this ranking process is complex. I let staff do that. I have complete confidence in staff's ranking process. This is a horrible situation. My own basement was flooded with God knows what a couple of years ago. I mean, we're talking, it, I could have raised tilapia in my basement. And you know, I can understand because it is a disaster when this happens. So. Um, you know, I, I just tell you, if you are thinking about moving stuff around, be prepared to offer another card out of your deck mm -hmm. because this is not a free process. So just warning, what, word, word to the wise. Councillor Benares. Whereas I'm the new kid on the block and I'm not a moss back at this point, but I'm certainly happy having been a, a Salem citizen for so long, a little bit of moss in the corners. Um, if you understand the Favorite Neighborhood Association, it was annexed in many, many years ago. At that point, it never did have storm drains. It had ditches running along most of the, most of the lot lines along the street. Perhaps, and, and this is, could be a, a, since this is on the CIP for two years out, it's not like it's going to be an ignored issue. Perhaps the solution might be some way that we can either return some of those ditches that have been filled in by neighbors or whatever over a period of time. They're, they're there, then they disappear, that kind of thing. Somebody's filled them in so they could park their car along the street. If we could get that so that the water could at least have a channel, what was there before, until we can get the pipes into the ground. Well, we could certainly take a look. I, I, I have seen the engineering report. I know that the elevations aren't that bad, uh, that bad the, the difference between Moonlight and, and Lone Oak. So I think I think it'd be worth at least taking a look at, and it wouldn't be that expensive, and it would solve the problem now before we can get some pipe in the ground. Ready to go, Councillor Bennett? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor, I move the staff recommendation. Second. Oh, close the hearing. I'm sorry. sorry I need to close the hearing. Yep. All right, the hearing is closed. Madam Mayor, I move the staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Tesler to move the staff recommendation. Is there discussion? Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Procedural question. In the event um, one would uh, make a motion to have staff come back with a report to shift uh, timing on two projects, uh, 60745 being one with something um, that would you know, take place next year that is similar in, in cost, but it, it's actually not creating damage, what, what would be the, uh, the methodology for that? If one were to approve the CIP as it is and then do a change as, as we swap two projects, or how could that work? You have two options. You have a motion to amend something previously adopted which would be a, you could, you could come back in and through a counselor's motion, make a motion to amend the CIP and that could take place at some point in the future. Uh, the other uh, parliamentary procedure that you have that's available to you is a motion to defer to time certain, which you could make and then that would take precedence over the main motion that's on the floor and the motion to defer to time certain would be, um, you would first have to make a motion to amend the main motion and then a motion to defer until time certain which would be to set it out for two weeks or four weeks or whenever you'd want it brought back. So those are the, the two methods that you have available to you. And since this isn't land use, a question of staff in that regard then, um, is a couple of weeks a viable time frame to find an alternative project or Mr. Fernandez, uh, that, that seems area, like a short you know? time frame to me, but. Well, it wouldn't take us very long to, to you know, what, what, what we would have to do is, is 
really, it's not it's not a very expensive project. You, know, you look right. at CIP, it's a three hundred thousand dollar project. So it's really about uh, you know level of effort. You know what what project that we have, you know budgeted that's in the pipeline would just kind of get delayed, so that we could we could get you know this one done, and that's that's what we'd have to look at. It won't take us very long to to look at it and make that determination. To make it clean, um, I'd like to just meet with staff. Yeah. Um, within the next couple of days, we could move to reconsider in the event there were two projects that we found that would not uh, put anyone out. Um, and I can take a look through it as well, and if staff will sit down with me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Councillor Bennett, did you have your hand up? I did. That's a, okay. that's a good solution. I did have one question. Uh, it refers to it as the preliminary capital improvement plan. Is there a final capital improvement plan? <laughs> I mean, are we somewhere along a continuum that would allow... <laughs> yeah, allow I, yeah as soon as you vote, to, it'll be a <laughs> final. I mean, are we shutting the door here if we vote for this? Well, uh, you know, the, you can always... We bring, mm -hmm. like, like, like I responded to with the, with the project, we bring projects forward all the, you know, mid year as issues come up that we have to address that were that were unforeseen so this one is kind of a foreseen uh, you know my recommendation to the council would be go ahead and adopt this and we'll see what this is right. and we'll just come we'll yeah. come back with a staff report if there's a if there's a yeah. change that has to be made and if I can follow because it right. sounded like staff really wasn't they thought something was there that was not and so wasn't necessarily aware of the extent of the problem um. as well but I don't know if that's a true statement or not so I'd like to understand it a little more as well and uh, see what options might be available to us. Okay, There's a, there is a motion on the floor. I heard something said about come back later for a move no. to, no. My, the motion on the floor as it was presented is the one that's there. It's I the had one. some options to do some other things, but at worst another case, date. Okay. At, at our next meeting, I still have the ability to yes. move to reconsider move to the decision made here tonight. And that's right. where that would take place if, if in fact, or we find it. Yes. <laughs> or counselor. Or, or everybody says yes. no, even then. And yeah, I, I think what I, I and I'll try and see if I understand this correctly, is at any time during the next several months or year that you can come up, you know, you and the public works director work something out and he comes in and we have a motion and this thing can move right along. I mm -hmm. I don't want to leave the folks on Alana wondering too long, but but it seems like it's something that could be resolved without revisiting the CIP. That it could be moved up. Do I understand that correctly? If I may, too. I'm sorry, David Lacey from Administrative Services. Uh, Council Policy C9. If you look at Section 3I, it's under Budget Implementation, and it says upon adoption of the CIP, projects identified in Year One of the adopted CIP will be included in the proposed budget for Council approval. Mid-year amendments to the CIP will be treated as amendments to the City's adopted budget, and will be made through the supplemental budget process. So you wouldn't have to readopt the CIP. With yeah. that change. So we good. wouldn't have to good. Okay. do any reconsiderations or anything. We could just resolve it in our normal course of business. Don't you think? Okay. Councillor Clem? And I, I hardly endorse that. Uh, staff has worked very well with property owners um, mm -hmm. just to resolve some of these drainage issues without it replacing projects in the CIP. And so I look forward to them continuing to do that here. All right. Thank you. All right. We have a motion on the floor. It was a, a motion to adopt the um, the preliminary capital improvement plan. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to uh, special orders of business. We had several items that were pulled. So we will go back to that list. The first item that was pulled is 3.2B, and I believe, if I'm correct, that was pulled by Councillor Clausen, correct? Yes. All right. Councillor Clausen, would you like to make a motion? Yep. Back up here. Um, I'd move staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Clausen, seconded by Councillor Tesler to move the staff recommendation. 
Is there discussion? Yes. Yes, Councillor Clausen. I pulled this mainly for a little discussion and some questions of staff. Um, I First, I appreciate staff uh, turning this around quickly. There were some issues that came up. I know Councillor Bennett was right on this about when we raised our fees, all of a sudden you're having to carry this giant bag of quarters around for parking downtown and around the Capitol. And so this cash keys program is intended to be something to make it a lot easier for these business owners, for the users of the parking down, you know, in the paid parking areas to be able to do this. So my question hinges around, I'm a little bit concerned about our fees. Um, the intent of this is that we're trying to make it easier for these people so that they can come in, but I'm a little concerned that they've got to buy a key for $24 and then to reload the key, say you buy it for 24 bucks, you put $100 worth of, worth of parking money on it and you use your 100 bucks up, then you want to go in and recharge it. Now I've got to pay 1750 above what I want to recharge it with. And I'm just wondering if we're making this cost prohibitive with these fees and the costs. And um, I would maybe like some feedback from staff. I, I definitely recognize it takes staff time, but I want this to be usable and a benefit to the users. Right. And Ms. Woods, I think, is prepared to respond to that. And probably Mr. Wells as well. Vicki Harden Woods, community, your community development director. <laughs> um, the, the fees that are set, uh, the, the, the cost of the key is $24, so that's mm -hmm. kind of a set cost. The processing component of that, which is what pays for staffing our pack counter, so all transactions at the staff counter pay that fee. It's um, divided up between actually paying for the staffing and then paying for the software, the Amanda software that does almost all of the transactions through the pack counter. So every transaction that goes through there pays that cost. And it's already set out in our fee schedule that way. And if we don't do that, then the general fund or the parking fund would have to subsidize the cost. The parking fund would could fund it? Is that what I just heard? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you heard could. I don't think so. All right. I, John, John Wales, John yes. Wales, Urban Development Director. Just for, for clarification, there oh, are no I'll meters in the downtown right now. The parking fund would not Sorry. be would not be paid okay. for this. It would be a general fund. Exchange. Sorry, my mistake. I'd forgotten that. Just the old general fund. Okay, Councilor Nanke, you Thank had you, a Madam comment Mayor. or question? Yeah, two pieces here. One, uh, how many cash keys are we looking at? Lots. How many, how many were there? And I'm assuming there may be a couple of more because of the expense increase. I'm going to ask Sheree Wargren to come. I think it's about 130, 130. Uh, yes, and we had 55 returned when we closed the program. So we anticipate 55 will be in right away to, um, you know, repurchase a, a cash key. And then I think I probably have 12 people on a waiting list that want to um, have the program. And so, yeah, I think that's probably about right. But again, until we offer it, we're not going to know how many are going to come back in. But we had 55 turn them back we'll in before more. when we closed the program. So the question would be is, why does it have to go through the pack counter? I mean, you can get a little thing that sticks on your phone now and take somebody's money and reallocate something mm -hmm. through it. It's, it's just a, like a credit card, right, that we're adding money to? And it, um, well, the cash key is a specific technology that works in meters, parking meters that take coins. So someday we'll be there. <laughs> uh, we have to upgrade our equipment to... Uh, go to that type of technology. So it's a key. It's literally a it's key, literally a key, that key can with be electronics loaded in it. that um, works with the meters. It, I mean, it, unless somebody really wants to take a whole ton of money out there, the percentage each time it could a hundred bucks. That okay, almost twenty percent fee to add that to my key. Be. Then it's like just ick. Councillor um, Dickey, and then oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Councillor Dickey, and then Councillor Bennett. Yeah, along the same lines as Councillor Nanke, um, I just wanted to comment that I will be glad when the city is able to catch up with the 21st century and just have something that you can swipe your credit card. I mean, it is really ridiculous when you try to go down where there are parking meters and you're just like, you know, shuffling through the bottom of your purse to find a nickel and hope you don't get a ticket. So um, it's it's pretty ridiculous. I know that it's it's um, it's cost 
prohibitive at this point and you know hopefully someday we'll get there because I think that's that is kind of the norm and so I my big concern is um, I worry about people who come here from other places because you know, other cities have credit card um, meters and then they come here and then they're stuck because they're you know they're visitors they have no idea now what do I do I have no change all I have is my credit card I had no idea I had to have change for this meter Right. Yeah. If, if I could, um, Mayor, part of the, the work that Council's been doing is uh, you've directed us to look at uh, upgrading that technology. And so we're in the process of doing that and hope to um, come up with something that's more like a pay and display technology rather than the meter heads we have right now because that equipment is out of date. Um, that takes uh, a process to go through and then there's debt service to pay and so council increased the parking fees in those areas to help pay for that debt service. So we're on our way. The problem is that in the meantime, uh, you've expressed, some of the counselors have expressed a need to have these cash keys, so at least it will help in the meantime. Because that won't be a long-term technology that we'll use, um, that's why we're suggesting that people would pay the cost of those keys so they don't have to turn them in, we don't have to track where they go, which is some additional staff time. So it is an interim step. Uh, as we go, but it's something that I think will help in the short term until we change that technology. Councillor Bennett, and then Councillor Clausen, then Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you're all in luck. On uh, April 29th, you'll get to spend <laughs> a substantial amount of time talking about parking as you sit down with the parking task force and go through all of this. Uh, the Mayor and I have been doing this for several months, and uh, what you find when you get into this parking, uh, this whole parking system is exactly what the manager is describing, an out of date, almost irreplaceable parking meter system in town and our only option to offer a convenience to people who are, who are using the meters, and this is generally in the Capitol Mall area, are these keys. And uh, as as uh, you all know, I work uh, down in the Capitol building during the session. This is the most common thing. Right now, people would pay almost anything not to carry the amount of quarters you need to carry in order to plug the meter. This is a true convenience. It, it, the people who are buying them will line up to buy them. There will be probably, ultimately, 100 people who will come in and buy these things. This isn't for the one-time visitor. This is a more, uh, a more of a long-term use during the period. Uh, this is really a convenience people are asking us for. I, I really recommend, although the prices are, you wish we could just give this stuff away. That has been the philosophy of the council for years, to give away parking. And the result is we're running over a million dollar a year deficit in parking. So I'd ask you not to kind of continue that approach. While it, it might feel good tonight, come Wednesday, it won't feel nearly so good when we take a look at that budget. I just ask you to, to support this. I, I think it really is something the people who buy it want it. People who don't buy it don't have to buy it. They can have a handful of quarters. There's really a good choice here. So I ask you to support it. Councilor Clausen. Well, Councilor Bennett went exactly where I was going, except the opposite side. <laughs> I was thinking about it. Let's say we put out 100 of them. That's $2,400, but we already own 55 of them. So we're having to buy another 60. And we hiked rates to where it's almost impossible to park in metered spaces. I wonder if we're going to make more money because people are actually going to pay for their parking. Right now, I went down to the Capitol a couple weeks ago and uh, was walking around with staff and everybody. And I was walking back to my car. and. 19 out of 20 spots had expired meters. And I'm just wondering if we give them a convenient way, if we give them a convenient way of paying for their parking, maybe it'll happen. And, you know, I just, I don't think we should rely on the fact that we have a really expensive parking system with really antiquated systems. I mean, that's our fault. That's our deal. It's not the people who are trying to park downtown. It's not their fault. And I just, I just want to consider it. I'm just throwing it out there for thought. Um, Maybe we just give the keys out, check them out, and then sell them on eBay afterwards. I don't know. But uh, 
I'm just concerned about it. I mean, this is something that we got ourselves into, and I just want to make sure we get a usable system in the end for the people who use it. Councillor Nanke and then Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any problem charging for the key, because that's the convenience on the front end. My issue is with 1750 every time you want to reload something onto it. Yeah. Um, and is that that's blanket fee across at the PAC Center? Does it really cost us 1750 for someone to say, here's my debit card, take 100 bucks, put it on it, and have somebody type three things into the computer? I mean, what is our true cost of performing that service? I know from speaking to my staff, they think this is the true cost. There's more to it than just typing something into the computer. There's the accounting component to it and the software that supports it and the staff time that it takes. I think they think it'll take about 10 or 15 minutes to do that when they load the key. So Are you serious? Th that's the understanding that I have from the staff. And I could come back with more information for you if you like. Um, I didn't realize there was going to be a deep discussion <laughs> about this tonight. I have a question. I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. But we do have a meeting scheduled with the parking task force. And I'm wondering if that might be an appropriate moment at which we could further explore or discuss this. And Councillor Bennett, I'm looking at you since we co-chair that task force. And what are your thoughts about that? Uh, Madam Mayor, the only concern I have is we have a whole list of mm -hmm. policy issues to bring to the council, including some fairly controversial ones that are mm -hmm. going to... I'm just concerned if uh, if we... I, I, think it, I think we ought to just decide it, I guess, tonight. This is a okay. fairly easy one compared to the ones we're going to bring to you next. Uh, <laughs> so I, if, this, if this kind of... Uh, uh, fiscal approach uh, isn't acceptable. It'll be an, it'll help us inform our discussion later because that's what we're looking at is we're trying to cover the costs of parking. And we have the testimony of our staff. This is the cost of parking. It is not, it just isn't free. And every time we make these kind of decisions, we have to kind of uh, and you'll hear that at our discussion. I just recommend we move this along. Uh, if we hear reaction and, and we, or we get information from staff, whoops, it was twice, it was half as expensive, we can adjust those rates any time, and I would expect our staff to keep us informed. But I, I'm confident that uh, we're looking at real costs. And, and mm -hmm. it's going to be a shocker to, I think it was to all of us, how expensive parking really is, free parking. And I use the term loosely. And I, c I can just yeah. say, when I received this draft staff report last Wednesday at Docket, yeah. I was concerned about the overall cost as well and asked the department staffs to get back together again <clears throat> and make sure this was the only way to do it and it really did cost that much. And after they met again and reluctant and met with me, I, I felt comfortable that this is what the cost is and it isn't you know, a short-term solution to a a much bigger, more satisfying solution, I think, as we go forward. All right, Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. I, I agree that uh, while I don't like the recharge cost, if that's what the cost of doing business is, that's what it is. I would encourage that we would move forward. And then I think if 55 people don't show up, then staff can tell us and we can cancel the cash key program again. Yeah. If it's just not going to be used, um, we'll be happy to sell quarters, I guess. But um, I think it just all headlights. It, it, all, it just headlights for me how yeah. antiquated our parking system yeah. is. So the sooner we can get to something in this century, um, the better. This is going to be one of those necessary evils to bridge us over financially until we can. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. We have a motion on the floor. It was moved by Councillor Bennett, as I remember. No, Clausen, and seconded by Councillor Tesler. Ready for the uh, call for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Our next item was 3.2C. And I note that Councillor Clausen had pulled that. Councillor Clausen, do you have a motion? Yes. Uh, okay. Staff recommendation. I'll move staff recommendation. Second. 
It's been moved by Councillor Clausen and seconded by Councillor Tesler to move staff recommendation. Is there discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, my concern on this one, uh, I'm really happy that we have this in front of us. This is a good thing for the residents of Salem so they can um, get loans refinanced into a much better rate where they haven't, we haven't had the means to be able to subrogate our loans in the past. Um, my question was about the $500 fee and if that's going to make this a, uh, a, a lose deal for the people who are trying to do it. And in talking with the city manager and Mr. Wales, it sounds like that $500 fee would actually go to the closing of the property for the refinance, so it wouldn't be a check that the person has to write to the city. I just wanted to verify that that's correct. Uh, that, that is correct. Uh, the property owner could do that if they choose, but most likely they would refinance it as part of the, the whole loan package. Okay, good. As long as it goes that way, I think it makes sense. I just, you know, if somebody's in financial distress where they're trying to do this, that would be a breaker. So anyway, that was good and I appreciated the help. All right. It's been moved by Councillor Clausen and seconded by Councillor Tesler to approve the staff recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. Our next item that was pulled is an action item 3.3B, pulled by Councillor Tesler. Thank you. Um, I uh, First of all, I'll move staff recommendation. Second. So this one and 3.2A, I'm just kind of lumped together in my comments, but um, you know, the Bush Park um, play equipment was something that it was really kind of tragic when this tri this play equipment was hauled off because um, if anybody's ever been to the playground at Bush Park that has the crooked house, it is covered with kids like termites, you know? I mean, they're everywhere, you know? And um, I have to say that I personally like the crooked house myself. So, but anyway, um, we really had to remove, we had to remove this equipment, we had to remove some other equipment at Bush Park and a lot of people let me know how unhappy they were about this. So um, I know we have to be safe. I guess I grew up in an age where you could fall off the slide at the top part or the monkey bars and people would just go, okay, stop your whining and you just go climb up and up again. But um, I guess those are the, that was the day. But we need to get some safer equipment in there. And so these good people at SCAN have put together some really excellent um, proposals. And this one concerns lottery funds. And I think it's got a really high chance of getting funded. So thank you again to the staff for helping my good neighborhood association here. And the second one is the donation from the Compton family who I'd really like to thank publicly for all the good things that they've done in Bush Park especially. Um, we have a really, I really would encourage everybody to go see the roadies. Um, they're really, really beautiful. Um, the garden is set up so it's on a hillside so you can, you can walk on the paths and you can really appreciate the rhododendrons there. And Wally and the, the, roadie, the roadie gang have really um, taken a lot of TLC with the garden and it looks really good. And one of the, um, another person um, of SCAN, unfortunately their name has fled my mind, but this woman hand weeded uh, basically the whole hillside there so that, um, and I am not kidding you, so only the camas and the other native flowers remain. She weeded out all the noxious weeds. It's absolutely stunning right now. Wow. It's just stunning. So um, just really wanted to just give the nod for both of these items and give them a little highlight and really thank the active people that we have in our park system because without these citizens and without staff that helps them, we would not have these really good things in our community and without people like the Compton family and other people that help us with our SPIF grants. We have a lot of anonymous donors who give money to buy play equipment. Um, we would not be able to replace a lot of the older play equipment. Um, the only thing that did make me mad is that Keith Kiever hauled off the slide before I could go and get it and put it in my yard. <laughs> But, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's basically what I wanted to say about those two items and um, urge your support on both. Thank you, all right. The motion on the floor is for item 3.3B, move staff recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. Our next item is 3.3C, pulled by Councillor Bednars. I'd like to move staff, staff recommendation. Second. Is there discussion? 
I should say it's been moved by Councillor Bednarz and seconded by Councillor Clem. Now, discussion. Okay, thank you. I, I brought the issue up. I, oh. Uh, because I wanted to just say I, I'm really appreciative of SEDCOR. I'm really appreciative of NORPAC. And this is what I've been talking about, the city of Salem being active in bringing jobs to this community. This is just one leg of a multi-leg stool. I'm, I'm very, very happy to see cold storage, which we have proven in this community to be short. Uh, I'm also happy to see that there will be improvements to the frontage along um, um, Madrona so that we don't have the same kind of problems that we're, we're having currently along McGillcrest. We'll have sidewalks and on the south side of, I think it's Ewald is on the, on the other side of their lot. But anyway, some improvements to an area that has long needed the improvements in that uh, intersection and uh, long lines of traffic that end up there in the afternoon. We almost go back to the railroad tracks they back up so bad. Anyway, I just want to want to say thank you very much for having this. I, I very much support it. All right, the motion on the floor. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Coming at this from a different direction <clears throat> because it, um, it wasn't noted in a staff report and we've mentioned it a while back. Um, this improvement was slated to be completed by the Fairview property, correct? The, the improvement is is a condition of approval on sustainable Fairview, yes. And in the event we use streets and bridges bond monies for that, they would then have a $5 million project that would be something different from this. Right, when we put together that, uh, that uh, the development district fee agreement with them, we laid out a series of projects that were water, stormwater, sewer, not sewer, uh, parks and transportation, and they're listed in relative order. Uh, if this project is uh, completed with a different funding, so somebody, another entity such as the city of Salem builds this project, then there are, a, uh, there are an additional list of projects that uh, uh, that they have that, that they can do so so they don't get off without doing without without spending the money uh, there is development going on at sustainable Fairview you know you the mm -hmm. council worked on the Colson mm -hmm. and Colson Simpson. piece mm -hmm. uh, depending on how quickly that develops and and development district fee dollars go into that that is another leverage that uh, so they could they, they could possibly fund a piece of this project still, uh, because you know we're we're going to be two years away from actually constructing this, uh, even with approval. So uh, they could well still fund a piece, but whatever differential is, they'll they'll owe it to us on another project. So my question would be: it's, uh, potentially a million dollars from other. Could we hit them up or if they put the four million do they save one million by having it still done because there's outside funds coming in who is they fairview no fairview fairview has the project not not a list of funding sources so so they got to spend all of their development district fee dollars okay. on it's, it's like question. a pseudo I, I hate to use the term because randall get mad at me but it's like a pseudo sdc right so all the all the funds that come into that pot have to be spent on infrastructure. So we'll spend it on something. I was just curious as to whether or not, <laughs> since there were other money, is it, hey, take advantage of it now and you could save a million off of, you know, yeah, five. But, so. but they still, it doesn't matter because okay. if they saved a million, we, they would still have to spend the million on something else. And it would still be in regards to transportation. Those fees would be locked into that portion of no, it? No, no, no. It's, it's water improvements, transportation improvements, stormwater improvements, and parks. I'm just thinking if we're moving some bond monies that were designated for streets, it would be nice to still have streets. There are, there. that's not the way the DDF was set okay. up, and I would be reticent to to recommend that to you because, hey, there could be flooding issues that we might want there to address. There could be, many money. people's basements. <laughs> to, to, go back, to go back to the theory of the DDF, the idea was that we had these two pieces of property that were state owned, right. that weren't master planned, and so, so the improvements were SDC. needed were not included in the SDC right. uh, 309 list. And so we established the uh, development district as you're absolutely correct, Peter. It's a pseudo um, SDC. SDC, or it's actually a sort of a parallel form of SDC. An SDC, equivalent. right? So, so the limit, the 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 limits are part of the 
are part of the de development district formation process and the order they're establishing the district. Okay, thank you. And a DDF, I'm guessing now, is a development district fee. Fee. DDF, development district fee. Thank you. Okay. Good question. <laughs> I didn't know either. Well, I don't know all the alphabet <laughs> soup yet. There, there's also an A E I O U associated with this. Well, I think we do an A E I O U in a minute too. So, all right, let's get back here. Glosson, <laughs> Councillor Glosson, I think had a comment. Yeah, um, I appreciated the the 22nd Street discussion that was in here because I would love to see that happen. Uh, if I'm um, just the way it's worded, does this mean? if funds are available we would try to do the 22nd improvement connection or how does yeah. that tie so, in so the 22nd improvement is you know a great idea uh, unfortunately it's a great idea that's never made it into our transportation system plan uh, so so what we want to do first and foremost is do the you know we have some money available we want to make sure that we can do the Madrona 25th realignment first and foremost and then if we have some of this leveraging then we should have money left over to be able to make that connection. Uh, that can, what we want to do is we want to talk to the four property owners that are impacted. I know of one property owner that's that's very supportive of it. So now we got to talk to the other three that are that are impacted. Uh, make sure that they understand what we're doing. You know, we'll have to buy the right away from them. We'll have to address some parking losses and the like. Uh, but if we can make it happen and everybody is in agreement, it's it's a very important connection. And is that included in the est estimate of five million? Yeah, yeah, it's in there. Well, it's you know, it's until we get into design, until we figure out what the leveraging is, we think five million is enough to do the Madrona project. Okay. If we get some of this other leveraging, and we continue to see good bids, then there should be plenty of money to do uh, 22nd. the Twenty Second Street project. I'll tell you that if if one or more of the property owners decide that they don't really like the idea or are gonna wanna fight us uh, for right-of-way acquisition, uh, we yeah. may just leave Scrap that for it. another day. Would we have to amend the TSP to do that yeah. if it was to move forward? We, we would if we got into a right-of-way acquisition issue. I mean, it's just a local street connection, so right. so the answer is no. But, but if we got into a situation where we had to do condemnation and the like, then we probably would wanna do some amendments and, and, and think it through a little more. So, so we're hopeful that everybody will see what an important project this is, that they'll want to work cooperatively with us. We're not asking for anything. Uh, but you know, until we ask and engage those folks, we, we won't really know. Okay, thank you. Was there anyone else who wanted to speak on this issue? Okay, I think we're done. We have a f motion on the floor to move staff recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. Our next item is 3.3 D, and I believe it's been pulled by Councillor Dickey. Do you have a motion? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I move staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Dickey and seconded by Councillor Clem. Is there discussion? Councillor Dickey? Um, yes, I actually have a few questions of staff, um, so I'll, I'll do them one at a time, not do all at the same time. Um, first of all, just because this has been a very long process, um, and I know that um, it's it's been even hard for us to kind of understand, okay, where is this timeline going? Where are we going with this? Could you just explain where are we in the process sure. and where are we going from here? And then, and along with that question, the big question, a lot of people have um, addressed funding tonight. When do mm -hmm. we talk about that? Sure. Where does that come along in the process? Sure. So. Uh, so the council, you know, just to recap briefly, the council had a public hearing in November. Uh, the council decided that they needed to th talk through a number of issues related to the proposed, to the recommended alternative, which is 4D. Uh, we had four work sessions. So what this staff report represents is the conclusion of those work sessions. So, so we heard, you know, we visited with you, we heard your comments and we put it together and said, this is what we think we heard, you know, 4D with these modifications. What, what you're doing tonight is really approving, you know, saying, yes, Saf, you heard us correctly. This is in fact how we want 
you know, 4D to be modified. So that will wrap up the, you know, we promised the public that we, well, in fact, we cannot make a, a, a decision in, exec, in, uh, in the work session. So here we are on the floor of the council with a staff report that summarizes the changes. So, so approving the staff report tonight basically says, yes, that's how we w want to proceed. The next step, as we have promised the public, is a, uh, a public hearing so that the public can comment on the conclusion of your work session. So that's what is proposed for uh, two weeks from, from today, where you'll hear testimony. Uh, if you decide to move forward with, with whatever, then, then that's what the, the governing body of the city of Salem is sending back to the EIS process to say, this is, thank you for your recommendation of 4D. What we want is 4D with these modifications. The project team will then take that and then continue on the EIS process. So things like cost estimates, things like redesigning, you know, the, the bridge isn't gonna look, Councilor Clem brought her handy dandy poster. The bridge will no longer look like this because, you know, the, the, ramps, the, the ramps in West Salem are going away so it'll be more of a straight shot bridge. Uh, what are the costs of removing the piers from the water? What, what are the savings of removing the viaduct? But there's, some, uh, there's an added expense because we're gonna build a new interchange at Eola. So all that will be put in the mix. Uh, it's gonna take a little while. And then what will come back is a recommendation to amend the transportation system plan for that project in its, in its EIS in its final EIS form. Once the council does that, you know, there'll be another public hearing, so there'll be another opportunity for people to testify. Then once the council adopts the TSP amendments, then the final EIS will be issued. And then at that point, we have, and that final EIS, at that point, will have, co you know, more, I mean, costs that can be produced at that level of design. But there'll be costs, uh, there'll be some amount of preliminary design, there'll be a good vision then of where this is going. Then once that's in place, we have license to build, then we have to seek funding. And that is a whole other process. Do, does the federal government show up to give us money? Do we propose a bond? Do we get in line at ODOT? I mean, do we toll, do we, I mean, that really depends then on the council to decide how quickly you want to move forward with this and to find uh, that funding. That could be immediately, that could be five years later. I mean, that, it's, that's, so that's, that's the process. At the public hearing, uh, Julie Warnicke will provide you with you know, a more complete presentation of you know, the 4, 4D, what the modifications are, and what the next steps are so that everybody can hear it you know, in, more, in more detail. Uh, yes, go ahead, Councillor Dickey. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for that explanation. That's helpful. Um, so just, I, I just want to kind of um, ask about what Councillor Clem had alluded to a little bit earlier, that um, if we have the public hearing and we choose to carry it over, we don't have any particular deadline, like we've got to make a decision on April 22nd or on May, What I mean, you see what I'm saying? The timeline yeah. continues to be yours. Okay. Uh, originally, you'll recall that at the work sessions, I had talked about after this step tonight that we would go and visit with our partners and then come back in a month. Uh, what we're hearing is that these changes aren't significant enough for the partners to worry about, so it's okay to just go ahead and proceed and, and put that into the mix, that the partners are going to be okay with that. So, so we've kind of lopped off that piece. So I would fully expect that uh, a, a project that is so complex, the amount of interest that there is, that you would probably open the public hearing, take testimony, and then carry it over at least to one meeting to, uh, uh, to pr uh, provide more testimony. Just please, no more work sessions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I ask. <laughs> Okay, Councillor Clausen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, uh, Mr. Fernandez, on the a point of order on the, so we would have to amend our TSP prior to the final EIS? That is my understanding. Julie Warnick and mm -hmm. I were talking uh, earlier today, and the way she explained it to me is that, the, yeah, there would be a step where they would ask us 
to amend our TSP to include these items, and then the final EIS would be issued after. Interesting. I thought it would be the other way around. I, I thought so too, but I was corrected earlier today. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Clem. Yes, and uh, in guidance from Federal Highway, um, I learned that as well that before a, a finally uh, because when the final EIS is final. Um, there's a record of decision that goes with it. You can't have a record of a decision on something that's not in your TSP. So I, I think that's what they. Um, yes, uh, that's definitely what we heard. Okay. All right. Any further questions? All right. We have a motion on the floor. It's been moved by Councillor Dickey and seconded by Councillor Clem to adopt staff recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. In your packet and on your computers are information reports. And I encourage everyone to take a look at those. And I understand that Councillor Bennett wants to pull one of these items 7C. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, I move uh, the City Council hold a public hearing on specific conditional use site plan review case number SCUSPR 13 01. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Tesler to. Uh, request a hearing on uh, a public hearing on item um, case number SCUSPR 13 01. Is there discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor. Yes. I was uh, contacted uh, generally about this issue by uh, some folks from the Grant Neighborhood Association asking for this, uh, this public hearing, and I'd be very interested in what their issues are as well as hearing what's going on here. I, I don't know. That's okay. why I'm asking for a public hearing. All right. Is there any further discussion? The motion on the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll now proceed to um, ordinances. Uh, there are no first readings. Would the city recorder please proceed with the second readings? Yes. Ordinance Bill Number 1-13, relating to freestanding signs, amending SRC 900.075. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Bernards? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Ordinance Bill Number 1713, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 2518 Robbins Lane Southeast, annexed to the City of Salem, pres prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Bernards? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Ordinance Bill Number 2213, relating to parking, amending SRC 102.135 and 102.175. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Bernards? Aye. Councillor Clem? Aye. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Mayor Peterson? Aye. Thank you. We have one person who signed up this evening for public comment, Mr. Ron Sturba. Mr. Ron Sturba is here. I saw you and wondered, were you really <coughs> going to wait through this great big long meeting? Welcome. You, you may use either it's podium. Just a that work. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> um, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, staff, city staff, and counselors. Um, I'm Ron Sturber. I live at 520th Street Northeast here in Salem. Um, I have a picture that's supposed to be posted up there. That is the uh, Willamette River, flood of 96, taken from the uh, Marion Street Bridge. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I love this city, and I don't think this Mitchell Island footbridge needs to be built. The Statesman Journal newspaper had a poll survey March the 29th. Uh, the question was, will you use the Mental Island pedestrian bicycle bridge once it's built? 29% of the people polled said they would use it. Only 29%. I attended last Friday's Salem City Club lunch and program about the Mental Island Bridge. I thought it was very informative. Several of the audience members uh, were a bit confused on the city's direction toward the theme to this bridge. I was one of them. The Mental Island Park was presented as a wildlife area of some 800 plus acres. But your pictures indicate a running marathon and lots of bicycles. This bridge looks like something between two skyscrapers in San Francisco. And again, I want to say I'm not against connecting the parks and the bike trails. It's the fashion and the way you're doing it to get to the island. This is a floodway that you are going to build it in. And will FEMA also allow US or Oregon State grant monies to be used on a project built in a floodway? I had a discussion with a young man about Salem taxes uh, spent on the project with no economic return. It's grant money. I told him it's somebody's tax money in Oregon and that the money paid uh, was expected to be used by the governor and the legislators for good, wise projects. I have been told many times many, many ways to accomplish connecting the bikes, like a floating walkways like they have on the Willamette River on the East Bank in downtown Portland a smaller wooden bridge up the slough, more conducive to a wildlife theme. No bridge at all, and keep it a wildlife area, or like a lighted walkway, uh, like they have, or a wa lighted walkway from Boise Cascade south to Owens and South River Road, just like the one that's along the river, or the railroad on 12th Street. Again, the survey says only 29% of the people polled would use the bridge. I didn't think a public works project with only 29% support would be completed. Whoever is pushing this project in the city really needs to listen to its citizens and stop. Several weeks ago, I was stopped by a man walking in a parking lot out south. He recognized me and said, he supports the no bridge opposition, and he said his wife Excuse will not me. walk the trails of Mitchell Island. Excuse me, I'm going to have to bridge. draw your attention to the red light. Uh, your time is up. But thank you very much for your testimony and for coming down this evening. Can you wrap up in just a couple more words? Yes, I can. Okay. As people have named the bridge, the bridge to nowhere, my best regards to all the staff who has worked on this, and God bless you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming down this evening. All right, we have no uh, new business, no mayor's items or councilor's items, and we are adjourned to an executive session.